What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I am joined by Matthew Majinskis, who is a phenomenal Austrian economist and praxeological thinker and analyst. Uh, he, in the first part of our conversation, we delve down into well the, the basics uh, of, of praxeology and what this economic school of thought has to offer. And we compare it to other mainstream uh, ways of thinking, mainly Keynesian economics. Uh, and we see where that leads us, especially in the uh, context of ethics right? and, and doing the right thing and not stealing from others. Uh, and later on, we focus on the breadth of Matthew's research, and that is a base money analysis. Uh, so base money is like a gold coin uh, or like a Bitcoin or like fiat cash or central bank reserves. Uh, these, this is the money proper per se and not a claim on the money like a certificate to a gold coin in a vault uh, or a credit card uh, a fiat token. And this is especially interesting for, for anyone trying to venture out in this very uncertain times of fiat hyperinflation, uh, where the money supply is continuously being increased uh, at unheard of rates. Uh, or, well, no, it's actually quite steady and normal for the fiat realm. Uh, but this is very important for you to understand why we Bitcoin and why 21 million Bitcoin money supply is one of the most genius uh, and useful inventions of the 21st century. So without any further ado, uh, here is my conversation with Matthew Majinskis about the Bitcoin money supply. Welcome, Matthew Majinskis. How are you today? Max, doing just fine, my friend. Doing just fine. Thanks for having me on. So you have done a splash uh, in the Bitcoin space with your stellar analysis uh, of, of money supplies on the global fiat scheme and comparing that and articulating that in a context of Bitcoin. Uh, and this is incredibly meaningful work that I would love to talk down uh, or go down into this rabbit hole today. So to start this out with, why are you actually interested in you know money supply analysis and Bitcoin per se? Yeah, yeah. So I, I've told this story a few times. I'll try to, you know, I, I like to get on tangents. So just stop me if I'm on too, too big of a tangent. But for me, it was all about, um, as I think for a lot of people, the 2008 financial slide, you start asking questions, why is this happening? Um, you know, I was like 25 at the time, 20, 26, when this stuff's really going down. Um, and I had just moved to Europe a couple of years prior, straight out of university. And, uh, there was a credit bubble all over the world. Right. And the more you read about it, the more you read that usually credit bubbles don't happen all over the world. Like only 10 years prior in the Asian crisis, uh, the Russian ruble crisis, these things were kind of localized in the mid nineties. Uh, same thing with some of the crises in the U S in the eighties. Um, no doubt there are crises in, you know, many developing countries I'm unaware of, or crises in Germany, uh, at different times, uh, or, or recessions or whatnot, they were more localized and specifically with 2008, it was a global financial crisis really, which the world had, uh, never seen. Um, I guess that's kind of a kind of embellishment. I mean, you know, the great depression was pretty global, but, uh, in any event, specifically with real estate, which I was, uh, and still do to this day. Um, I do a lot of corporate finance work, which basically means spreadsheets and helping clients, investors understand their financial position, deal with their banks, help them with their, uh, with their financing and their loans, help them with their management accounting. Um, I just always was sort of intrigued with the way that, you know, the numbers, the story that the numbers, uh, could tell. And I was young and I just didn't know anything about how economics worked at the time. So I started to delve in, you know, go down that rabbit hole of, uh, why these crises do happen, why they've gotten bigger, why they've gotten more global, quickly found the Austrian school, quickly found Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Murray Rothbard, uh, Menger, you know, all the, all the greats there. Um, and, uh, yeah, just quickly, quickly sort of fell down that rabbit hole as well. Simultaneously is definitely the case for many Americans, even though I was American living abroad. Uh, Ron Paul was on the scene, like in a big way, he's definitely on the scene, you know, for, for years and years and decades before running for president in uh, 1988. But, um, you know, he, he, he made a big splash in, in, in 2008 and, uh, that was intriguing to me. And he was just such a, uh, eloquent and, and powerful speaker for like freedom and peace and markets. 
I just thought that this had to be, there had to be something to this. So um, all of that, obviously many uh, libertarians, free market, classical liberal people uh, who like peace and markets and prosperity, uh, they sort of go through their own journey and what they want to learn and do. I know Fernando, my former uh, co-host, still, you know, a color commentator, he comes on, uh, he will come on uh, every once in a while. We can talk about that. But he had the same exact experience as me. You know, he's about my age. 2008 was the same thing. And many, many people, uh, no doubt, uh, can empathize with that sort of thing uh, that are about my age. You know, we're in our mid-20s, early 20s at the time. We just We just sort of discovered something that we were completely... Uh, completely like blinded to and inept to before, which I had no idea. And the Austrian school definitely offered a lot of solutions there, a lot of explanations. But I always came at it from my sort of, I don't know, for better or for worse, I just was interested in financial uh, analysis and the numbers and working through uh, figures, again, like I said, to tell a story. So uh, that's that's sort of how it all came to be for me. Very interesting that 2018 really was that point where you got more curious about finding answers. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, and it, that was for one because uh, the crisis happened at the large scale, at the global scale. Uh, and, and before that, that never happened. But still, there were countless crises on, on the smaller scale throughout the history of, of fiat money. So I'm curious, what do you think is the explanation that the mainstream Keynesian economists would provide for these frequent boom and bust cycles? What do I think their explanation is, or do I think their explanation is correct? <laughs> uh, well, first, let's line out what the argument is, and then let's see if it's a good one or not. Yeah. Well, um, I don't agree with their conclusion, um, and the conclusion that they espouse seems to have arisen during a time of the 20th century of uh, exactly um, exactly that sort of a centralization of power a centralization of um, authority around the world where um, and, and, and a centralization of military power as well uh, literally step by step you know from World War one to the Great Depression to World War two um, these sort of uh, locally, you, you sort of went from a very uh, decentralized and des disparate um, European, US, North American um, developed sort of economies and, and Asian as well, Japan, no doubt, very developed uh, during those times, uh, always, you know, for centuries uh, before that as well. Um, they, they just sort of kept, you, you just saw how this centralization of power, the centralization of sort of the ac academia, academic wing of um, the state, you know, as many, many free market economists like to quote, you know, obviously, where do all the research papers come from? They come from government funded economists, you know, who apparently are telling us, you know, groundbreaking things about the money supply or whatever. Uh, it's coming from the taxpayer, the, 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 the source of those papers and all of this research. So it was clearly coming from a more centralized sort of uh, an entity, whereas the more free market classical liberal school, which obviously Keynes and Hayek uh, famously have had this debate, you know, over, you know, the course of the 20th century when just massive death and destruction and socialism and authoritarianism was ravaging so much of the world, including where I am right now, former Soviet Union, um, you know, where my family, uh, one half of my family is from. That argument like I, I never really thought about it, never really learned about it um, in, 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 in grade school or, 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 or high school, the, the gymnasium, as we'd say, or in Europe or, or even in university. Um, never understood any of it. And it just had to be through my own curiosity after the financial crisis where I actually realized, okay, there actually is a prescription here that the big government, big uh, corporation, you know, this military industrial complex con consistently prescribes. And that is that um, you need to spend more even more and more in the uh in the bad times than you spent in the good times and you know theoretically yes we're supposed to save more in the good times so we can spend more in the bad times but um there just seemed to be something that wasn't quite right there because there was always a solution with more spending more debt more government intervention whereas on a micro level which is really the only economics that like makes sense you know everybody's day-to-day -day lives paying their credit card bill uh you know their salaries feeding their families so on and so forth 
like you that never works that never would ever ever be a re, uh, a viable solution for an individual for their family for their micro economy for their community for their church for their whatever they may believe in you just never ever say that we're just going to keep uh rolling the debt over ex effectively raising our credit limit taking on more credit and in sometimes even rolling credit into our operational budget where we really can't even afford with our own taxes as it comes, you know, even the U S government, you know, States can still go bankrupt. But, um, this idea of like money printing and this idea of, uh, if, if you can't afford it, just kick the can down the road, print the money. Um, these types of things like they've happened throughout history. They happened in the Roman times. They happened, uh, in, in the middle ages, in medieval times, they happened all in, you know, 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, you know, John Law, you know, the Scot who famously just came in and destroyed the French economy. Um, all of this stuff is, uh, has been, ha has been tried again and again and again, yet somehow it keeps being spun as the solution to the very problems that they created too much debt, too much spending. Um, yet that's what we need more of. We need more of. So the, you know, this cyclical iterative, um, conclusion solution that's just continue to print, continue to borrow, continue to spend um, without really ever looking at, you know, the asset side, the income side, um, you know, is it really worth to have these programs? Is it really worth it to, you know, spend militarily or whatever the case may be? You can, you can really roll it on any uh, government program that you want. It just, it's really hard to believe that that is sort of the way that humanity should go forward when truly, truly on a micro level, um, which is what Austrians typically focus on. Uh, it's just never, that's never, ever the case. It's never the case um, that you just keep borrowing and spending and, and presume that somehow that's going to get you out of whatever hole that you're in. No, you need to pare back. You need to stop your spending, stop your borrowing, stop your uh, reckless behavior that got you into the trouble in the first place and try to be more responsible. Like if it works on a personal level, why would we think that that would not be the solution on the uh, national level and now like the global level. Um, and obviously the answer is very clear because, uh, you know, th there is no accountability there. You know, Milton Friedman famously said four ways to spend money. Uh, you know, you can spend, I won't go through them all in detail, but you know, the, the best way to spend money is your money, your own money on yourself. That's when you're going to be the most prudent and careful and thoughtful and efficient and, uh, and, and just the best way to spend your own money versus the other way down on the other side of the quadrant there is spend somebody else's money on someone else that's the world of taxes that's the world of government it's just it's just you know fake flag planting for small political gain for people that have no skin in the game there is literally no reason that you know that anything that they said should be taken with any sort of uh moral authority because it never would work on the micro level it just would never work on the micro level. So it's institutionalization. Um, it's, it's just, you know, these beasts that are governments, uh, particularly on the national level, when they have the power of the printing press at their will, uh, can really just be uncontrollable. And uh, we see that that just continues again and again and again. And um, I'm a very hesitant, a lot of Bitcoiners, Austrians, free market, classical liberal folk like to say that there comes a point. I'm very hesitant to actually say that because we have... <laughs> seen again and again, we can even look at that chart I prepared for you later on in the show or talk about it. Governments have tried this over the centuries, over modern decades, and whatever point there is, they seem to always be able to move past it, get people to rally in their corner of, you know, printing the money, borrowing the money, that's the way out. And that's just, it doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem right to me, it never seemed right to me, and it doesn't seem right to a lot of people. And I think Bitcoin is, as always, shining a bright, bright, bright spotlight on all of these dogmatic, simplified uh, solutions that the big government, big state, big uh, military, industrial, medical, industrial complex has, uh, you know, sort of foisted upon us over the years. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that uh, I, I definitely do not agree with their, uh, their solution, which they continue to offer and are offering at the present uh, moment. Yes, beautiful tangent. I love it. And one thing from the early part of it uh, is that you bring up that the the idea is that when you're in a bad position, just spend more money. 
consume more, produce more, right? Uh, it, it, and I think this reaction causes or is caused by the assumption of the labor theory of value, which is a pretty old idea and yeah. more recently formulated by Adam Smith and then picked up by both Marx and Keynes. Um, and, it, uh, you know, according to this theory, if, if what creates value is in fact the, the pure and benign and sometimes stupid labor of humans, well then, yes, if you're not doing that well, go out and dig a hole and then you have some labor and apparently that's going to increase your values. And so this seems to me the, the root cause of some of the actions and, and viewpoints uh, of the Keynesian mainstream view. And maybe now let's compare this to subjective value theory uh, as the Austrians follow it. Yeah, precisely, precisely, Max. I think that's uh, that's a beautiful way to compare it. It's the appropriate way to compare it, even when you uh, before you go into sort of the debt and spending tangents, as I was saying, um, is yeah, simply look at if you're going to look at labor theory, which is still utilized today, you know, jobs and all this stuff. Like as that's like the main crux of the issue. Uh, then all you would need to do is go out in your backyard and yeah, dig holes, uh, you know, install uh, wooden posts, you know, bridges to nowhere uh electricity lines to nowhere then everyone would have a job and you could just you know as the brits say which is a quote i never understand bob is your uncle you know you just move on and it's great uh, obviously that is not again on the micro level it would never work why do we think on the macro level it's going to work and there's going to be a net gain for uh society and yes as uh the great austrian you know basically one of the founders of the austrian school Karl menger uh sort of uh discovered and and basically um you know, shared the light uh, to, to the world of this point is that value does not come from labor or some individual uh, endeavor or, or even a gross, uh, you know, macro endeavor that's just based on pure spending or creation of something. Of something. It comes on this idea of uh, subjective value, which when we, uh, you know, engage in economic exchange, um, every time, it doesn't matter if you're a government, if you're a person, if you're a company, a firm, um, a firm with a, monopol a monopoly privilege from a government, every individual ac actor in the market, when they engage in exchange, they're always engaging uh, in, in exchange and trade because they value the thing they are trading for more than the thing they are trading against. You know, the common one in the Austrian school, many, well, there's many, you know, you can use the coffee example, the bread example, you can go to the bakery the baker values your money more than he values the bread that he is baking. You value the bread that he is baking more than the money that you hold in your cash balance. So very basic idea, but obviously it rings true um, in the market. And thus you can see that really who is in charge, the, the, the source, the source of this value is not some unit of labor. It's not some omniscient government. It's not some planning board, you know, as Friedrich Hayek used to and liked to rail against. It's not any of those things. What it is, is the subjective want and demand of the consumer. And if the consumer is not satisfied with that demand, they go somewhere else and that producer goes bankrupt or uh, they are satisfied with the demand and that producer is rewarded in the market with more profits, can expand his business and on we go. Yeah. And this, the struggle between objective evaluation and subjective evaluation is, I think, a, a very critical one to, to understand. And I would even argue that here both praxeologists like Ludwig von Mises or Karl Menger would be in agreement with psychologists like Carl Jung or Andreas Solzhenitsyn with that there is a objective meta valuation that every individual, if asked, would would claim that this is correct and accurate. It's like a, a true meta ethics of, of how to evaluate. And I would argue that this Mises describes this as human action, um, meaning that individuals have problems and they have that genius spark to envision a future where these problems are solved. They can envision a future state where this uneasiness is removed as Ludwig von Mises uh, says so. And then action is is applying force and your, your willpower to fix the problem, to change the situation. Right? And th this is the objective part of valuation. It, if you have a problem and you fix that problem, then we can say a priori that this was a valuable and meaningful exercise for you because it did fix a problem. 
And this is the objective outside view. Now, where the subjective valuations come in is that even though everyone would agree that you have problems that, that you can fix them, um, not everyone agrees on what the problem is, right? So that's the first thing. Yeah. And the second thing is how do you solve any given problem? And here is where the subjective valuation comes in. What's actually your problem? That's nobody that that's nothing that someone else can define for you or dictate to you. Um, and then especially how are you going to deal with that problem? Again, something that is inherently subjective and not to be meddled with by outside forces. Absolutely. Absolutely. And from there, you can jump right in, uh, to, I mean, many Austrians have written about this, you know, Mises, I think, uh, really well, Rothbard perhaps pop popularized it, but Mises, um, Mises sort of was one of the first original thinkers on this. There's two, well, the first thing, uh, th there's two things that jump from this idea of subjective value for me that are most important. The first one is actually not what I was just speaking about, but uh, Mises definitely quoted it as well. The first one is caveat emptor, you know, which is a, you know, Roman, you know, sort of old Roman law type of a, a thing, you know, everything good, uh, well, not everything good, but a lot of the uh, things that have stood the test of time, you know, are still in, in Latin for good reason. Uh, caveat emptor, you know, let the buyer beware. Uh, the, the responsibility of that um, action that you take at, at the end of the day cannot rely on a nanny taking care of you. It has to rely on yourself and your family. The, at the end of the day, the responsibility for that action. And if you are unsatisfied with that choice, if it does not meet your subjective value needs, then you act again. You might try to sue, which is a whole other can of wax, obviously. The, the, the courts of law but if it's not worth your time to even sue you just move on you post uh negative reviews on the internet in the modern world or you uh you know tell people about okay this is a bad thing we need to uh you know not uh not not um share our hard-earned uh dollars or euros or yen with this uh entity we need to move on so that's the first thing that's it's always very important to me as far as like how to analyze um just subjective value in, in the modern world, uh, business cases and so on. And the second one was more what I was alluding to before about Mises being the first one to really popularize this is the idea of monopoly. So monopoly and Adam Smith wrote this way as well, the exact same way, exact same way is that monopoly does not mean a, as Tom Woods like to say, you know, this sort of uh, goofy looking character with a mustache running around with big sacks of uh, bags with dollar signs on them you know, and just monopolizing uh, rents and collecting and screwing all of the little guys and becoming apparently so big because apparently he was so good, he or she were, were so good in their business endeavor that they w stole 95% of the market share or 100% of the market share uh, and then had the ability to come in and undercut the amazing efficiency that they themselves had apparently brought to the market, undercut themselves, uh, shoot themselves in the foot, raise prices, and just screw, you know, all the mom and pops shops out of, uh, the marketplace. And, you know, just, you know, we are, we are ruined, you know, just fall into this disrepair, you know, Marx, I think even thought that there would eventually just be one firm in the whole world. These ideas are patently false. Uh, literally there, there is no, there's no, if you look at, if you take away the influence of the government, there's no evidence ever of this occurring in the marketplace. And even if there was one firm without government help that made it to 100% of the market share, this sort of cartoon view of monopoly, at least, at least there would still be the threat of another entrance, another competitor coming in to the marketplace to uh, take out the exorbitantly high prices or whatever sort of is happening because there's only one person in controlling, uh, one, one firm or individual or group of people controlling the market. That said, what monopoly really means and what Adam Smith wrote about and Mises popularized and Rothbard popularized further was this idea that uh, there really is no such thing as a, fr as a free market monopoly or the cartoon version of monopoly. Monopoly is very simply, very simply, it's a firm in the marketplace that has a special privilege from the government, a special license to operate from the government. So here we go again with this large entity, which has, is immune to sort of market forces, um, you know, for better, for worse, unfortunately, I think mostly for worse, has the ability to tax and spend, uh, has the ability to operate with coercion, not persuasion, that it's the government. When they grant a license to uh, an individual actor in the, in the marketplace to operate 
and they prohibit other firms from operating and competing in the same sector or whatever, that is a monopoly and that is a problem. And that is where we'll see the distortion and the price, uh, price rises, undercuts, gouging problems is always, always, always look toward the uh, government in the room uh, when you see something sort of wrong in the marketplace or something seems fishy to you or you don't like that this firm is this big, don't look to why they're so amazing and why people are happy with their service because if they're happy with their service, they're happy with their service. That's it. Full stop. Like, If they're not happy, they're going to walk away. You have the choice in the marketplace to walk away. Look toward, if you see something and in, in you're, you're, you're suspecting some foul play, always look towards the relationship that that firm has with the government. And chances are, in fact, not even chances are, guaranteed, guaranteed, they're going to have a special license from the government to operate with impunity the way that they do. And obviously the one that interested me most, and you know, I don't want to jump ahead, we can still talk about this stuff more if you want, but the firm that most famously throughout modern history has, uh, has, has gained from this uh, idea of monopoly is what, in, in the financial world is what we call uh, the central bank. In the financial world, the central bank is the, is the, uh, is the grantee of the government monopoly license. And only central bank can do things that no one else in the marketplace can do, presumably for the betterment of society and humanity and our finances. But in reality, at least as far as I can tell, with the way that money supplies are measured and calculated, uh, it's precisely the opposite. And again, Bitcoin shines a huge bright light on this problem. So to summarize, this is kind of my go-to when you talk about the Austrian school, when I try to educate people on it. It's like subjective value, absolutely. But then right after that, it's, caveat emptor and then if it's not caveat emptor something must be wrong uh look towards monopoly that's and monopoly defined the proper way the classical way where it's a firm with a special privilege from the government that is going to cause uh distortions in the marketplace so subjective value caveat emptor and monopoly are my favorite sort of my go-to topics in the uh in the austrian school Yes, and monopoly is one of the terms, the words, that during the 20th century has been in a wizardry act of Orwellian doublespeak, twisted completely on, like inside out and makes no longer any sense in the modern definition. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it, if it really is a, a company or if, if there's only one company that provides a good or service, if that is the definition of a monopoly, well, guess what? Everyone is a monopoly then, uh, because each good and service is unique. Right? A bottle of water in the desert is very different than a bottle of water you know, in, in the jungle uh, next to a fresh spring. Yeah. Um, so for each good, you know, Apple is the only producer of Apple iPhones. Samsung is the only producer of Samsung, iPhone, uh, Samsung phones. And so each of these are on a certain enough viewpoint, a monopolist. And so then if we start applying force against monopolists, which some politicians would advocate for, well, then we have a complete arbitrary definition of who a monopolist is and against whom it is justified to, to apply force. And so here, similar to Marx's problem with class identification, that you can identify anyone in any class according to any view, just if you look hard enough. <laughs> and then that makes the, the justification to use force extremely dangerous and very broadly defined. Yeah, yeah. And you, uh, you touched on something there, which I would say probably is number four for me. Um, when you mentioned Apple and Samsung is, uh, you know, our, our friend, our Austrian uh, uh, guiding light in the world of IP uh, is, is uh, Stefan Kinselli, writes about this a lot, has written great stuff about this, is, is probably after that would be, you know, this IP patent copyright uh legislation which really is a subset of monopoly it's a it's a special privilege that a firm in the marketplace gets to produce something apparently based on their own you know creative initiative and it's you know to spur other people to be creative because you're gonna get this granted this patent granted for you know x amount of years and it's gonna be great for you and it's gonna be great for society but in reality uh, patent copyright law is abused. It's moronic. I mean, there are just insane patents that are on the books from like 1937 that are just so dumb and hilarious. It's, it's a joke. It's a joke of a thing. Yeah. And, and also who enforces the patents? Well, today, apparently it's the United States, even, you know, European companies, they love to have a United States patent. I mean, they don't even, not even in the United States and they, and they love to have a United States patent um, because this sort of joke of an idea of the patent uh, or the copyright is going to protect you. And 
lo and behold, one of our, you know, uh, notable, I'd say, copyright cases in the last 10 years has, has been between Apple and Samsung. Two good companies on their own right, two good uh, uh, players in their respective parts of the world, wasted hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions. I haven't really followed lately, but I mean, they, 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 these, these lawsuits were all the time. They're still ongoing. Uh, Apple defending their patents, Samsung defending their patents. Um, you know, no doubt you have some other Chinese companies involved now. Uh, I know Samsung's, Samsung is Korean. I'm saying other companies in China as well are, are always involved in this patent disputes, copyright disputes. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars that are spent by, you know, going to lawyers and court fees to define the definition of this black rectangle that, you know, has really just developed on its own because that's what people wanted. But, you know, apparently this black rectangle in your pocket is such a sacred figure and form that we all, you know, could only survive on the, you know, omniscient uh, uh, hearings on high from apparently United States courts, primarily about what the black rectangle should be, whose idea was it? Uh, are the corners rounded enough? Are they not rounded enough? Is the screen glossy enough? Is it not glossy enough? Where did you get the materials? This is this is just a joke. I mean, it's a joke on it's, it's so obvious that the consumer benefits nothing here the only people that benefit are certain interests and lawyers court fees uh government connected players to these lawsuits and maybe short-term profits for the company maybe maybe I, I don't know if there's like great studies on that but i mean certainly the consumers do not benefit the consumer does not benefit from all of these monopolistic practices and defense of monopolistic licenses that are called patents and copyrights from these big tech firms at all. The consumer doesn't benefit at all. all. Only people that benefit are the companies, the entrenched interests. There's no benefit to the end consumer there. All it does is waste time, waste money, and slow progress and human innovation, technological innovation down. That's all it does. So that's, that's number four on my list, for sure. <laughs> Yes, and listeners, go back two episodes back uh, for a long conversation with Stefan Kinsella about all the nuances of, of IP and the idea of ownership of scarce and non-scarce resources. Uh, we dive down into that topic uh, very much in depth. That's um, great. He's just great. Yes, yes. One of the people that I've learned so much from. <laughs> it, it's been ridiculous. So I stole all of his ideas uh, and <laughs> now I'm much better off. Yep, yep. Exactly. It's, it's endless, man. It's endless. The, the copyright and patent trolling stuff. It's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we will see how it will continue, but ultimately similar to a monopoly, um, a patent is the, the, the ability to use government violence against other individuals. That's ultimately what it stands for. In a monopoly, you can use the, the violence of the government to stop a new market participant from providing a similar good or service. And then in the sense of patents, uh, you can use government force for anyone who uses his own scarce resources to build something that looks like what you have thought of before. Um, so ultimately, it all comes down to, to the threat of violence. Yeah. And, and one more point there as well, it should be said, is there is an answer to the chicken and egg problem here. I mean, Rothbard wrote about this a lot, which I agree with 100%. You can't necessarily blame Apple and Samsung. You can't necessarily blame them for doing this because the laws are on the books. They're operating in the context of the law, in the context of their own monopoly, in the context of their own privilege. You can't necessarily blame the market actor for acting in a way that protects his interests, which are state granted. You know, like the ultimate arbiter is the state. And if they have a special privilege from the state, well, they're going to act in that way. It's the same thing. Um, it's the same thing in a slightly different way, but it's, it's, it's basically the same thing. Like if, if you're going to get tax credits for whatever it might be, I don't know, solar or whatever, I mean, you may be against the violence of the government and the coercion and the, uh, unfair uh, to use a mild word, uh, distribution of resources from one taxpayer to another. But I, I actually can't fault anybody in the marketplace for utilizing those tax credits. If they can, um, I can't fault them at all. And, and Rothbard, uh, definitely didn't fault the market actors. He fault, faulted the, this is the, go back to the chicken and the egg point that I made. It's just the very existence from the government. That's, that's the starting point. The existence from this entity, as Rothbard used to say, there's only the, the government and the, and the mafia are the only two entities that he was aware of where you could legally, uh, well, legally, I was going to say, where the business uh, model of the enterprise was coercion 
rather than persuasion. Like you simply at the, you know, however you want to say it, at the threat of going into a cage, at the threat of a gun, at the threat of uh, losing your well, uh, your, 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 uh, your hard earned uh, wealth, um, at the threat of those things, the government can compel you to do, to do its bidding. And so it's it's not a chicken and the egg problem. I don't I don't fault, even though you know, I just said you know it's Apple and Samsung were wasting resources. They did it with logical, well thought out, um, you know, intent based on uh, the monopolistic practices that were set in stone in the law. So that's actually another thing to keep in mind. Is it's very clear where it comes from. It comes from bad government legislation. And I'm not sure if there's good government legislation, but then you, you get too philosophical for 2021. Maybe, as I like to say, we're maybe 800 years from, uh, you know, a truly free market, uh, anarcho-capitalistic, voluntarist, good, greater good society where people are freely competing um, in the marketplace. They have private insurance. They have private uh, security uh, and the like. So we're a long, basically, it's a long way of saying that I don't think that's going to be solved anytime soon. Yes, and you know these these questions of morality are incredibly nuanced and difficult to to think about and to live by even more so. But but one of the things that I would somewhat tend to push back on is, and maybe in a phrasing like this, that if we have a order giver and a order follower, uh, so as example, there's Hitler, you know, giving a SS soldier the order mm. uh, to shoot this child, mm. and th the soldier does so. And now the question is, who is more morally culpable, the person giving the order or the person executing the order and actually acting? Um, and th this was, of course, one of the famous conundrums in the, in the Nuremberg trials, right? Uh, the, the defense of those soldiers was, well, we were just following orders. Yeah. We were just following the social conventions uh, in our society as they were justified and quote unquote agreed upon. Um, so it wasn't really us doing the bad thing, right? It was the leaders giving the orders, writing the laws that this is how you must act. Um, and, and I would argue that obviously both parts are morally culpable to some extent. Right? It, is, it is wrong to order to someone else to kill someone. But of course, it is wrong to follow that order. Yet I would argue that following the order, uh, actually acting with the knowledge of the government force behind you um, is is m m more bad. It's it's morally worse uh, than giving the order. Um, so he, he, in the case of Samsung versus Apple, I mean, sure, you, you, you live as a company in, in this society where intellectual property rights exist and they are justified, um, yet nevertheless, acting out aggressive behavior based on these justifications is very wrong and, and should not be done. Yeah, I I, uh, I I take your point, and I definitely agree with you. Obviously, with the uh, the the Hitler comparison and the uh, when it comes to life and death, uh, no question. But then I would ask you, Max, how how do you square when you go down the line, not just from a corporate position of Apple and Samsung, what might be the honorable or moral thing to do for those? uh companies in the context of the legal you know environment that they are in the monopolistic environment that they are in but let's go even further uh what about just the individual and his tax bill i mean do you think the individual should pay or do you think the individual should not pay and i i actually am curious because i i, I believe you might have a unique <laughs> answer to this based on your lifestyle as far as i know <laughs> i, I I think logical consistency and uh, being consistent between your thoughts, emotions, and actions is extremely important. And I, I would say that a morally conscious individual, if given the option of you, if you want to continue your company, uh, then you must use a, the government force to ensure your IP laws and stuff. Then I would argue that a morally conscious person would say, no, I, I will not do that. Even if I must sacrifice the, the company uh, and the potential profits uh, that I would have entailed. Um, now, now, arguably, this is even a, a societal decay, right? Because that company exits or, or no longer produces the services and goods that satisfy customers and that actually increase their valuations. So this is, it, it is for sure a, sa a sacrifice. And now the question is, how big of a sacrifice are you willing to offer in order to uphold your moral consistency? 
Uh, and that's a very tough question. <laughs> and the line has to be drawn somewhere, right? Because finding an ethic where you can 100% live by in every act is extremely, extremely difficult, maybe even impossible, at, at least to live in a society uh, at, at large with all the benefits of, of division of labor, it's just because people will well, disagree and do other things. But so it's, it's tough. I, I would say that the logical consistent option is something that is similarly portrayed in Atlas Shrugged, right? Where the, the heroic entrepreneurs and the creators and the builders and the problem solvers withdraw their consent, uh, of the, the, the that fiat system of, of socialism. Um, and just stop working uh, because the, the rules required to stay within that first realm society is simply not agreeable with basic human decency and, and morality. So I personally like that strategy, but I understand that it's a, a very costly strategy with the sacrifice that, that has to be provided. Yeah, it's the, the middle, the middle of the road part, uh, which is kind of a uh, apropos metaphor, but the, the, where you stand, where, where one, um, sits along the way to true, uh, and unencumbered freedom and private property, if we can ever get there, that's very difficult because, um, going back to the personal tax income tax example, if you don't pay and if they catch you, uh, they will throw you in a cage. So, um, withdrawing your consent is very difficult where we are right now in the middle of this process, I believe, which is improving, uh, in, in, in most ways. And Bitcoin is the, uh, the, the brightest star that we can follow to, to get there. But the, um, I, I don't know where, where we are right now. I think it's very difficult to not pay your taxes based on not only personal financial reasons, but on, you know, morally on moral grounds, uh, you just, they'll throw you in a cage otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, that's, but I mean, that's a pretty, you know, uh, cut and dry moral case. Like someone puts a gun to your head, someone give me all your money. Well, what do you do if we want to keep living? <laughs> yes, you give him the money and you take that sacrifice in order to preserve your life. Right? But what about, uh, what, we'll take that back to the Hitler example. Um, in, in the sense that if the soldier would not follow the order, he, he would might, get executed lose, himself. Yeah, he might lose his life too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's, that's the thing. Protecting... I'm, not, I'm not put i'm not i agree with what you're saying mac that i, I just that, that that's uh i was just thinking that yes it's quite difficult it can be quite difficult regardless of the situation exactly because society requires a sacrifice at, at some point w with your moral principles uh well i'm not sure if that's a requirement but at least it's the current manifestation of how things are right uh so right. Right. So yes, if, if you would live up by your principles and you would get put you know shot and and put into a cage well then Yes, that will affect your decision making. That's that's in part the the horror and the evil uh, of, uh, of of regulations. Um, yet w w one thing that is a bit more of an interesting moral case is what you mentioned earlier. What if you can get a tax break, uh, or even better, what if you can get a subsidy from the government? Yeah. Right. What what if you can actually get some of the money from the government to then use in your own causes? And of course, one early viewpoint would be, well, I've already paid my taxes in the past. So this is just me getting my money back, right? That's the thief, you know, <laughs> stealing a hundred bucks and giving me 50 back. I mean, that's great, right? He, he only stole 50 bucks from me. And that's, that's true in a, in a macro sense, but if you look into it, it's not a fungible, uh, fungible transaction here. The thief stole from you last year, a hundred Bitcoin, right? But now if to, he's already spent that hundred Bitcoin on, you know, hookers and cocaine, uh, probably. Uh, so now when he comes back today and gives you the 50 bucks, this is not the money that he stole from you 10, uh, a year ago. This is the money that yesterday he stole from someone else. So if you would take that money now, it's not you getting back your money from earlier. It's you hiring a thug to pick up a money from another innocent individual today. Uh, and that is, uh, I would say, very much uh, a, a moral act. It's basically giving the order, um, in a sense, to steal from someone else. Yeah, I got to find it. Uh, I want to uh, always quote things that are, you know, true and, and, and uh, you know, appropriate. Um, as well, we have to 
take into account appeal to authority is not the end uh, of you know the end all be all but I, Th there's there's arguments on both sides of this, even in the Mazzesi movement. I, I, I'm pretty sure Rothbard would always say take the subsidy. <laughs> I think he said take the subsidy. If you're gonna if you're gonna have the opportunity to take it, not not the opportunity, but if you if you have to get on, the subsidy is there, take it. But then I know that there are other people in equal parts. And and by the way, we can expand this to other. Like there are Austrians that have deeply divided views on uh, national defense, on borders, um, on borders particularly, right? And then, uh, what's the other one? There's another one's blanking me, but there's a couple like this, right? There's a couple like this. I, th I think there's actually good arguments on both sides, but in the context of the modern world that we're living in, you know, it's hard, it's, it's, it's hard to know which one would, would really, uh, yeah. be, I don't know, necessarily the most moral thing to do, but just the best thing to do necessarily for you personally or your family in, in the, the context of the situation. But I, I, I will hasten, I hasten to say like, this is not something I think about often. So. And I, th I think the argument that Rothbard provides is that the government already stole from the dude yesterday, and now they have, you know, these 50 Bitcoin at their disposal, and they could use those 50 Bitcoin to, you know, buy more guns and steal from more people. So if you actually somehow convince them to give those 50 Bitcoin to you, then that's an opportunity cost, meaning that they have less money to buy guns with. Uh, and, and therefore, the more money you actually can get from the government, the more that reduces their current liquid liquid capital that they could use to harass others. And I think that's a that's a valid point, that's true. Yet still, if you today agree to take the money from the the government, then they feel justified to tomorrow go out and steal again. Yeah. So it's it's somewhat of this kicking off the perpetual cycle. And uh, again, somewhat of a chicken and the egg problem. And I think the way to solve that is to just walk away. Yeah, you're not going to get an argument from me, honestly, Max. I, I think, uh, I think it, if we can be uh, moral and avoid cage time, or even worse, um, it's probably good to try to do that. It's probably good to try to do that. Yeah, so the, after this amazing detour into ethics uh, and <laughs> philosophy, l let's swing this back to something that uh, is, is your awesome expertise. And maybe to, to hunker this down, this is again a, or part of this is again a, a Aurelian doublespeak of the 20th century, meaning the definition of inflation. Uh, can you quickly speak what for hundreds of years or thousands of years, the actual definition of inflation was? and what it is nowadays and how that differs. Sure. Yeah. So the classical definition uh, always used in economics um, was obviously a core of catalactics, as Mises said, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the basic of economic calculation. There are, you know, three things, basically price, supply, and demand. And inflation always meant in classical economics, it meant uh, an increase in the supply of something, et cetera, as paribus. So without any change to the demand, or the price before anything happens, uh, if you increase the supply, you know, other stuff's going to happen. We, we'll talk about that. But inflation means literally an increase in the stock of a monetary good, a capital good, um, you know, the different implications about different sectors and whatnot, uh, product, productive good. But basically, it's an increase, uh, particularly with money, traditionally with money, it's an increase in the stock of the monetary good. That's the definition of inflation. And then, uh, as we know, most uh, central banks, uh, particularly Western central banks, not necessarily the Federal Reserve, uh, they started in the 80s to sort of call inflation a general rise in the increase of prices. And they started to target this general rise in the increase of prices, which they themselves calculate. <laughs> this general rise in the increase of prices, this basket of goods, this CPI index. And then they use that to achieve their uh, political means, government uh, subsidization of debt means, and um, other means, basically. It's a much more efficient way when you don't actually have to talk about the actual uh, hard supply increase in the money stock, in the currency, but you just have to talk about the general level of prices uh, again, I'm, ar I'm already showing my bias, obviously, you know, everybody knows it anyway. My conclusions are, you know, the same as yours. Th that is the new definition that has emerged over the last, you know, 50 years, really. Um, John Williams is an economist I like very much. Uh, he's a bit bearish. He's, you know, 
again with this this thing we were talking about before there comes a point i'm very I'm very careful to never say that because I don't know the point and the point can go for a long, long, long time or it can come up immediately and spring out of nowhere and, you know, screw the hell out of you. So I don't know the point when it gets to be too much and we can, we'll, we'll talk about this, I think, in a second. But most famously what John Williams, so, so my point is he, he's a bit bearish for me. He's always, he's kind of like, you know, these Peter Schiff, Jim Rickards types where they're like perma bears, regardless of their Bitcoin views. John Williams, I actually don't know his Bitcoin views, but he's... uh you know, he's got this sort of perma bear view on the economy um, based on his research. The uh, the interesting thing, so I, the, the reason I, again, just laid that out is that, that I don't take that view because I don't know when the point of no return is. But nonetheless, the interesting thing from his research is he has shown that from the 80s, from the 80s, this so-called definition of inflation, the modern definition of inflation, which is the increase in the general level of prices, consumer prices or producer prices, he's shown from the 80s that that has basically changed the underlying variables, the hedonics, the underlying you know inputs of these price indices have changed. Uh, the government does not measure inflation today, price inflation that is, the same way that they measured it in the 80s. And that again has massive political, economic, and fiscal implications for the taxpayer because the Medicare payments are based on this inflation. Uh, inflation, Medicare, M Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, entitlements, pension funds. It's the same way across the world. They are based on the increase in the level of those payments are based on the level of that inflation. And when you yourself make the payments, you collect the money, which is actually taxed twice, which we can t totally talk about. This is another just crazy thing that they do because they don't, it's not like money for social security sitting in some pot somewhere, in some vault anywhere. It's, it's not, it's not there. It doesn't exist. So it's already been paid out. They went cash flow negative in the U S in 2011. Now, any money that's been paid to a retiree in 2000, from 2011 on is money that's been taxed twice. It's been taxed twice. So they, uh, they, they do not like, it's completely political the way that the system it works. And the uh, definition of inflation, of course, they're going to change it. They're going to want to control it. And they're going to want to uh, define it the way that suits their political needs, the needs of this, you know, behemoth institutionalized entity that is the government. That is what they've done. Uh, it's very clearly what John Williams has shown. Uh, it's at least doubled. So when they say two, it's, it's actually four, probably more. But in any event, uh, one of the things I can say, I haven't spoken about it, but I will speak about it more often. Like I, I'm going to start to have uh, as an expansion of this monetary base exhibit, which we've done on uh, CryptoVoices.com uh, for the last three years, basically. It's very static. I know it's slow. If you ever go to the website, it loads. It's bootstrapped from Excel and Google Sheets. It's very, very slow, and you know, there's no development behind it. I'm getting some development behind it. It's going to be very uh, interactive, some good MySQL uh, calls that you can do, and it's going to be very, very good. Uh, so hopefully uh, it can help my own personal balance sheet there, and people will subscribe. It's not ready yet, but I'll let you know when it is. Um, you will never, the, the point is, you will never, ever, 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 I'm, I'm very proud of the data and the way that it's going to be put together and explained and the detail on top of the monetary base, but the other stuff that's going to be there. You will never, ever, ever, ever in a billion years see on my website, which is going to be sourced and whatever. It's not necessarily going to be open source because I'm going to try to make some money for it from now, but it's going to be sourced very well. You're never, ever, ever in a trillion years going to see price inflation indices compiled by the government as some sort of a metric to pay attention to or anything that I care about paying attention to on uh, my website, which is the way that I want to see data, which is what I believe many other people would like to see the data. It's just a made up thing. It's a made up thing. They've changed it in particularly over the last 30, 40 years. But, you know, New Zealand, Canada, these central banks started targeting inflation in like the late 80s. Federal Reserve doesn't have an official target, but they generally say 2%. It's really 4%, and it's at least 4%. But anyway, it's impossible to do. It's impossible to do. You know, UMAX, me, myself, uh, my family, um, m you know, my family in the U.S., my friends, whether they live in Ohio or Florida or New York, there is no one way, there is no one number where you can capture an individual's general purchasing power based on the supply and demand for economic goods. There's no one number that you can boil it down to. You can try, uh, you can try, and I give John Williams credit for at least using the official definitions that used in the 80s and show how 
skewed, it is today. Again, at least double the rate that they say, probably more. But even then, even then, it's imp- it's impossible to calculate. Price inflation is, it's it's uh, the only the only sort of sense that you're going to get is always a general sense. It's probably going to be a politicized sense, and there's just no way that you know I, I, people have different tastes for economic goods. Subjective value comes right back to the core of it. Like maybe I like filet mignon, maybe I like ground beef, maybe I like iPads, maybe I like. Uh, one of these cheap Xiaomi or whatever they're called, you know, Chinese devices that is much cheaper. Uh, maybe I like real estate in Manhattan. Maybe I like real estate in, you know, rural Indiana. There is no way that a general level of prices can be boiled out to one number nationally at the federal level and try to have that guide economic and fiscal and monetary policy, which are all blended together now. There's no independence between any of these agencies, Treasury and Central Bank and taxpayer basically um there there's there's no way that it can be boiled down to this one number which they have basically succeeded in this sort of collective psychosis telling the public that inflation means an increase in the general level of prices whether it be consumer index or producer index i will never in a billion years add that as a as a meaningful economic analysis to anything that i do and it will never it it just it never it never can be done it's it's impossible to do it's impossible to do. You cannot measure it. The best you could do is look at exchange rates in your own individual environment. Look at the price of gold. Look at the price of Bitcoin. By the way, every individual has a different price of gold, whether it be their cost basis or what they buy or sell or their sort of effective uh, purchasing power uh, based on their prior holdings or uh, how their purchasing power has changed from this last week to last week to this week. There is no way that any of that could be boiled down into one simple number meaning this cpi index increase of the consumer prices just no way you big it, tangent there but i will never ever in a billion years put any stock into that uh that type of a thing and again this this logical consistency is one of the many reasons why i like you <laughs> so please don't give it up easily <laughs> and it's it. It, it, it's even more than that, right? Not just is it, for, for all your reasons that you said, impossible to calculate such a global price, right, for everything. Uh, one additional reason why it's impossible is that the price itself is not how valuable the item is. This is, a, again, a fallacy that comes a bit out of the labor theory of value and the objective price valuation theory, meaning that if I sell... Uh, you know, Matthew, this uh, Lamborghini for 10 Bitcoin, then the Lamborghini is worth 10 Bitcoin yeah. objectively. Yeah. And that's that's false. That's yeah. false. Yeah. Um, why, why would uh, Matthew and I exchange something that has the exact same value for both of us? It None of us gains, right? So none of exactly. us would be encouraged to make that act. Exactly. W- what actually happens is when I buy, uh, uh, or I buy for 10 Bitcoin the Lambo from, from him, is that I value the Lamborghini more than 10 Bitcoin. It's more valuable than the thing that I sacrifice right now. And and how much valuable, uh, or how much more valuable is it? Again, that's nothing objective. That's very subjective. Up Maybe I would have been willing to pay exchange. 100 Bitcoin for this Lambo, right? And then I got it for 10. So that's, you know, it, the Lambo is for me much, much, much more valuable than the thing that I needed to sacrifice. Exactly. Well put, Max, completely well put. And... Uh, it's not to say that we can't calculate price, right? It's not to say that based on supply and demand, you know, we can't generally find a reference rate. It's kind of like the reference code for Bitcoin, right? Like there's a reference code for Bitcoin, uh, you know, with certain consensus rules and whatnot, just like there's a reference price for gold and oil and um, some of these commodities that are generally, you know, uh, just that. They're, they're the same material inside and out. They've been the same for years and years and years. For, forever i mean chemically like they, they, they won't change at least not in our modern world uh th- th- you can definitely uh derive a reference price based on supply and demand for some of these things commodities bitcoin gold oil whatever but that is that's still still a far cry a far far cry from analyzing a scientific economic politically uh, omniscient wonderfully planned uh decisions by our fiscal and monetary overlords that's just it, it's it cannot be done with that sort of an index as one number where you're just again picking 
random sectors out of thin air. Uh, it does not encompass every individual's actor, every individual actor's subjective value, as you as you very appropriately illustrate. And indeed, it's impossible. It's impossible to do so. Yes, uh, very much. And there's another thing that looking at uh, the change of purchasing power is only one of the many things that goes on when you increase the money supply, right? So yes, increased supply at the same demand, right? means a decrease in the price. Yes, that's, that's, that's logically consistent. But that's not the only thing that's going on, right? This is something that was also discovered very hundreds of years ago by Richard Cantillon, um, the, the Cantillon effect. So can you go into how we can look at an increase of the money supply further to get more meaningful insights other than just an, a decrease in purchasing power? Yeah, he was actually talking about gold, in fact, um, and he's talking about the uh, the impacts of uh, gold mining and gold uh, trade um, and, and the, the Cantillon effect. Uh, basically, those that are exposed and closest to the production primarily of money are typically those that benefit most from the uh, purchasing power of said money before before it filters out into the society and uh, the demand eventually catches up with such, of an, such an increase in, in supply. And uh, until it does, let's say, prices are going to rise. And those that are closest to the mining, to the fiscal trade of something like gold, which is you know, obviously a famous uh, historical commodity money in the world that we know, those that are closest to that uh, commodity benefit the most before it percolates and uh, demand catches up in the rest of society and thus price ha prices have to rise uh, to do so. So they benefit before the prices rise. And uh, the same can certainly be said today with the politically, uh, the political elites, the political uh, powers that be, certainly the market makers, the people that uh, gain uh, these things ca called bank reserves, which is modern day basic money bank reserves, basically electronic unit of money that's traded uh, between banks and central banks, primarily uh, reserves for government bonds, government bonds for reserves, what, depending on whether the central bank wants to increase or decrease the money supply, which typically, mostly always is an increase in the money supply. Maybe, maybe sometimes if you look at the paper money supply, which is the uh, the other portion of the monetary base, there's commercial bank reserves, which I've just described. Uh, and then there's also paper money, you know, notes and coins that we all, you know, love and hate, whatever in our wallets or under our beds. Um, that money supply actually as in olden days, as it is now, does tend to go up and down seasonally, uh, a little bit in the summer, a little bit in, uh, in uh, the uh, fall, actually but pretty much every season, but the biggest jumps are usually in the summer when people uh, uh, get paid, the, the late summer when people get paid, you know, at, during the, the, the biggest harvest times when people get paid, that's when they go up, um, as well as uh, around Christmas and New Year's. Um, money supply, the paper money supply typically goes up there. And then the demand for those cash balances fall during the rest of the year. Um, so that, that is true that money supply does tend to go up and down primarily with the paper today. But when you're talking about this bank reserve portion, which is basically uh, the biggest way, the biggest way in the modern world that the central bank monetizes uh, the economy, it, put, it literally puts money into the economy by buying government bonds that are floating in the marketplace openly, that is pretty much always expanded. Uh, but you do have to be consistent. You know, Fernando and I were, I think, the only ones, not the only ones, I'm exaggerating, but uh, this is another common thing that Bitcoiners like to do and gold bugs like to do is always say central banks just print, print, print. That's all they know how to do is print, print, print. You never would have heard that from us uh, during the start of our show in 2017 until uh, 2019 when, yeah, mid 2019, let's say, um, the central, which really from 2014 to 2019, the US Federal Reserve was actually trying to unwind all of the money that it had printed to buy bad mortgage-backed securities and other debt during the global financial crisis. They were actually not buying uh, new issuances of those, you know, that roll in that credit card over, they were not rolling. They were trying to let that money get out of the economy. And they did a somewhat, you know, consistent job from 2014 to 2019. But even in 2019, uh, the money supply actually never went negative globally, globally. But yeah, the US did not print money, in fact, uh, from 2014 to 20, 
19. So you never would have heard that from me because again, I'm just trying to look at the actual figures as, as they are. There's a lot of hypotheticals. There's a lot of uh, people like to, 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 to uh, embellish money printing, whatever. Some of that I probably don't want to go into too much here, but there is a number. There is a number, which is like the crux, I think, of what, what we're, we're getting into here, Max, is there is a number that uh, does measure the traditional, classical, Austrian definition of money, the traditional, just general economic Adam Smith definition of money. And today in our modern fiat world, that's called the monetary base. That is the central bank printing press. That is the printing press of the central bank, which is the monopoly institution uh, that uh, has this charter granted from the state. So the monetary base, which is physical notes and coins and commercial bank reserves, that is the printing press in the modern world today. And you can measure it. You can measure it. And uh, I've been doing that for about the past three years on, uh, on our Twitter feed as well. Very fun. <laughs> yes, very fun, very tedious work, and I'm extremely grateful that you do it. Um, b before we dive down into the nuances of, of how the, the fiat system has inflated over the last years, um, I just want to highlight one more time the, the the consequences of the Cantillon effect, or that are described in the Cantillon effect, the consequences of increasing the money supply. Mm. And they're, they're twofold, I would say. So f first of all is a shift in the percentage of the money supply for each participant. So l let's say we have this, this small economy with uh, Matthew, me, and well, Murray Rothbard. Uh, Rothbard is of course the richest guy, among, uh, no wait, uh, he was always the poorest. <laughs> uh, so, so Matthew, you're, you're the richest guy. Yeah. And so you have 50 oh, yeah. monetary units. Um, I, I have 30 and Murray has 20, right? the poor bastard. Uh, and now uh, the percentage of the total money supply of 100 units, right? So uh, Matthew has 50%, I have 30% and Murray 20%. Now, what happens if the richest guy among us just starts printing more money, right? Uh, so Matthew prints himself another 100 units of money. So we have a total money supply of 200. And all of a sudden, uh, Matthew has increased his nominal holdings of the money from 50 to 150. Right? While for Murray and me, we still have the same nominal units, 20 and 30, respectively. Uh, how, however, what did change is the percentage of the total money supply, right? Um, here, we, di we do see the first effect of increasing the money supply, meaning that the person who does, who receives the newly created money first, increases his percentage of the total money supply from 50% to 75% in our example. Mm -hmm. And that is... isn't well, an increase in wealth, right? In, in your proportional holdings of the capital in this monetary system. While then the people who have not yet received that money, Murray and me, we have decreased our percentage of the money supply holdings from 30% uh, to 15% and from 20% to 10%. Um, so these are the direct consequences and they happen at any time when you increase the money supply. Right. So this is the same if you increase the gold money supply, if you increase the Bitcoin money supply, if you increase the fiat money supply, that's that's always the same. Those who who receive the newly created money first gain a larger proportion of the percentage of the money supply, obviously. Right. Yeah. The only the, just the one thing, Max, the only thing I would say there is the key. I think the key word that you uh, should always say there is ceteris paribus, because it is possible. It is possible, but it typically does not happen. But it's possible that when the, even when the money supply is increased at that very moment uh the demand for whatever reason the demand for cash balances has gone down at the same time it is possible so if the demand goes down uh the increase in supply might not necessarily uh be you know reflected in a price change and you might just have uh you know you might just have a net zero effect in prices for time but generally Generally, yes, uh, you're going to have a more, a higher percentage of the wealth and a higher ability to use your purchasing power and that new wealth before, before prices go up once the market clears and, uh, you know, demand catches up with supply there. Exactly. That's, that's the second step of the analysis, right? So first we look just at money supply and we disregard the demand completely. And we just see when the supply change, how does the supply of, uh, of everyone uh, change, right? That's simply supply side. The, the next step is the demand side, right? And, and here, I think we see especially an issue if the increase in the money supply is hidden, right? And not publicly talked about, not publicly understood, 
right? So if if nobody knows that the money is being increased, well, then Murray and me, we're just not going to do anything. We will still think that we have 20% of the money supply when in fact we only have 10, right? Um, and the, this means that we will not adjust our prices upwards to reflect the actual percentage of, uh, of the money supply that we want to reflect uh, in this trade. Uh, and here is, I think, also where uh, Jörg Guido Holzmann brings in the ethics of money production, that per se, increasing the money supply, if everyone knows about it, and even better, if everyone agrees about it, is completely ethical. Yes, it is a shift of purchasing power still, just by the fact that the supply increases and some person is going to receive that new supply first. Right? But if everyone knows about it, at least everyone can adjust their prices adequately right? making it again, a, a fair and ethically correct system. Yeah. Yep. Right on. I think that's a very important point to, to make regarding, uh, the initial expansion of the money supply. It's, uh, it, the, the modern equivalent of this cancel on effect, which is originally, you know, discussing gold is now discussing, uh, the fiat expansion of the monetary base, which really can only benefit um, the government, which pays its bills all the time from either taxes that collects directly or from this authority that uh, th this privilege that it gives uh, a central bank in whatever jurisdiction it's in to basically buy its, uh, its, its uh, government debt that it cannot pay with taxes at that particular point in that particular quarter, in that particular month, in that particular year. And there's actually a second factor, Max, that even before we talk about prices, the main reason actually, uh, and this is where economists of, you know, as I mentioned before, who get paid by the federal government to write these, you know, apparently insightful papers about why inflation occurs. The main, the main, main aspect and, and a consequence of this money printing for the government, for the government, is that they have a massive player that is the central bank that can intervene in the market due to monopoly privilege, due to monopoly privilege, can print money literally from thin air, which I'm not trying to sound to trigger anybody. I'm just, that's literally what they do. They print money by the keystroke and they buy in the open market. They buy in the open market from banks, uh, the, their respective treasuries, government bonds, most primarily, you know, Japanese also buy Jap bank of Japan buys Facebook and Apple. So does bank of Switzerland, but primarily it is government bonds. And that is really the most like sort of historical, meaningful, important thing that happens is that the government debt, remember price moves inverse to interest rate. So when you have a huge player that's ready to stand by and buy that government to sop up that government debt, which is not really going to be funded in the market. Otherwise that will a prop up the price of that debt, make the debt worth more. But then again, remember bonds work like real estate. When price goes up, the yield goes down, the interest rate goes down. And so it's actually has a double effect of the price is worth more at the time, but then the, as, as time goes on, the interest payments on that debt are cheaper, are cheaper. So it's a, it's a win-win from the government. It's worth more at the time where the central bank steps in to buy the debt and monetize it and, you know, inject money into the economy to do so. And over time, interest rates will be lower than they otherwise would have been because of that act of propping up the price of the debt. Interest rates are thus lower and cheaper for the government to uh, finance, to pay for in the future. That's really what it comes that, that, that before you talk about interest rates, before you talk about unemployment, you know, which central banks are supposed to like manage unemployment. Before we talk about inflation of the prices, inflation of the general price level, which is really the, uh, the uh, modus operandi of central banks, right? The European Central Bank does not have an employment mandate. It just has an inflation mandate, meaning price inflation, the modern definition. Before you even can go through that doorstep, like before you even talk about that, that particular thing, it all comes down to the central bank having the privilege from the government to, to print money and to buy, to stand ready to buy government debt while doing so. That's was re original reason for the founding of the bank of England, bank of Sweden. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a life support. It's a, it's a life support that would not come from normal taxes and spending and, and blood, sweat, and tears from wars. Just as you know, many economists have written about wars are easier to finance during the mon uh, during the central banking age, which, you know, 20th century, good example, hundred million deaths from socialism and money printing. Uh, it would not exist otherwise. 
the sovereign, the state, uh, this 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 authority uh, that ha that grants monopoly monop monopolistic privilege, excuse me, that would not exist otherwise to the extent that it does had there not been a major economic actor in the room with a monopolistic pri privilege called the central bank, which is ready, stands ready to buy their debt when the government needs to. That's the main thing. There's, it's a symbiotic relationship. One exists for the other. It's not independent, but now I'm getting on tangents. So uh, that's the Yes, but th this ties back to what we spoke earlier about monopoly privileges and yeah. about what it actually means. Exactly. It, it, it means exactly. that if you want to spin up your own central bank, well, pretty soon you're going to get annoying phone calls and especially guys with guns in front of your house. <laughs> As the and... Austrians like to say, that's a, that's a guaranteed spot in jail to try to complete the central <laughs> bank. Yes, exactly. Um, so, so that's that's the first part, right? And and the second part, uh, as I brought up recently, is that if it's not publicly known how much money is being printed, like then this really turns into unethical theft very, very quickly. And I, I just want to get a bit of your thoughts about the difficulties to accumulate this information um, just based on that it's being published very late or not at all. Yeah. It, and, and that is seen by the simple fact that you're, as far as I know, the very first and very only person who who does curate the global base money supply of the fiat empire uh, in ever. So that's, uh, why is that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I mean, I, I do appreciate it. Like I, I, I uh, I'm not the time. I don't like to flex too much. And, you know, I, I do know it's like, I do feel like it's a feather in my cap. I do feel good about that fact that, uh, as you should I, I, yeah something i wanted to do i was excited about it and um i've enjoyed it i've gone through 55 central bank balance sheets i only published 30 there's more coming but you know it's, it's all story behind that but um i don't you know i don't know for sure uh, why it's not published globally i don't know why you can't go on the imf or the bis or uh the world bank website the three sort of main economic aggregators of data you know I, I don't know why they don't publish a mon global monetary base uh, stat, but I presume it's precisely because of the reasons that we're talking about is that they want to make it seem like that is a non-important issue. They never want to talk about stocks anymore. They never want to talk about flows and stocks. They want to talk about interest rates. They want to talk about a marginal effect for a marginal company's, you know, purchasing power or, or profit and loss. Uh, based on the debt service that they have to pay, because I think it's just because it's easier to economically model, right? You just econometric nonsense where apparently, you know, again, using the ceteris paribus, I can just, you know, I, I can move interest rates from 0.5% to 0.45% uh, or maybe even from 0% to negative 0.01%. Uh, and this is going to spur an X percentage increase in the production capacity of uh of producers in the economy and then thus the uh, purchasing habits of consumers. And they try to make it sound scientific, which it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. And they don't, again, you can't even get through the front door of the, of the stadium, the arena where all of this had the Coliseum where, where, where the money game takes place. It's not interest rates. It's not unemployment. The, the main issue, the main issue is the supply of money itself. That's precisely how they target the interest rate. That's precisely how they target employment. It's the stock of money. Yet, yet, uh, I never see it, the headline number. I never, never see that as the headline number from any news organization. Never has been. Maybe never will be. Um, they just don't want to draw attention to it. And so that's, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know any insiders. I mean, Fernando's kind of an insider. He he was on the board of the Brazilian Mint for a while. He's not anymore. He he has he hasn't given me any great insight there. But I I don't know the reason why it's not front and center. Because again, that is the crux of the issue: is the supply of money to me to me. I mean, I don't want to repeat myself. But before you get into interest rates, before you get into employment, all this other econometric nonsense, gobbledygook of you know economic speak. You got to talk. You got to look at the money supply. That's 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 where you're deriving your your sacred toolbox from. It's 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 the money supply. That's monetary policy. You're in charge of the money supply. So it is intriguing to me that they don't uh, broadcast it, and I don't know why. Uh, I will also say, central banks. Here's let, let me. I, I give you a small quiz here. Just a, just a, just a one question trivia. 
Think about all of the central banks in the world, Max, that I've reviewed, uh, which are like the, the main ones. Uh, and, and and let's you know, think about China, ECB, whatever, Fed. Uh, is there a central bank that you would think would be the most cloaked, the most uh, hiding of its information? Don't think too much of it as a trick question or not. You know, China can be in there, whatever. What central bank do you think is the most cloaked, or, or in my opinion, since I've gone through all these balance sheets, what, what central bank do you think is the most, I don't want to use it like danger, like, you know, subversive, whatever, but this is the most least transparent central bank. What, what do you think? What would be your guess? That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, intuitively, I would say that it's those that are the most reckless with stealing right now, just because then you have something to hide, no? And in, it, with that rationale, I would maybe say Canada. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you probably looked too much into it because I know you know Canada had a interesting pre-banking history, and yes, they are pretty like absolute mad uh, these days. Uh, we can publish another chart on that as well. Um, and they've sold all their gold and all this other stuff. I can understand why you might say that. I thought maybe you might say the uh, the PBOC, People's Bank of China, because uh, they're communists and they they just publish a very simple one-page balance sheet every month. Very late always like a month late very just they don't tell you the difference between notes and coins they it's very like very very basic numbers but my answer to you would be after about 50 plus central bank balance sheets that i've reviewed over these three years my answer would be the bank of england the bank interesting of england. yeah bank of england is the least transparent bank that i've seen they do not actually publish uh, a total balance sheet they do technically publish some total balance sheet figure for England only, but for England, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, Wales together, they don't. And then they write specifically, they write specifically, you know, we publish about 85 to 90% of our total assets. <laughs> they write that. So it's very funny to me. I mean, uh, even the Federal Reserve publishes a total asset number. Like you can derive like, okay, what are the assets in their books? It might be like some, you know, we don't know if they own Bitcoin or whatever. It might go into other assets at the moment. But um, the Bank of England, and obviously the Bank of England is the first modern central bank. The Bank of Sweden was the first. It was involved in sort of a bailout when they started again. It's always bailing out the sovereign. The, uh, the Bank of England is intriguingly, in my opinion, with its probably storied history of the gold market and the trade winds and everything else that they've done to uh, sort of manage the money supply in, uh, in the modern world. I would say that they are, they're the longest running fiat currency in the world and they are um, probably the least transparent. I'd say probably the least transparent. So I'd say that's, that's just, it's an aside, but it's an interesting uh, thing that I've noticed over the last couple of years. Yes, this is all very fascinating. Uh, let's go down into the nitty gritty of the numbers. Uh, can you give like an overarching trend throughout all the timeline that you have now analyzed? Uh, like how's the money printing going? <laughs> it's going. Uh, yeah, good question. Nice, nice, uh, nice way to put that there. The, the money printing is going, uh, continuing on just, uh, just uh, very consistently. I'm pulling up my latest thread here just to refer uh, users to. If you look at the, it's tweet 29 of the, uh, it's pinned to my profile, crypto underscore voices on Twitter. Uh, tweet 29 will show you the trailing 12 month inflation rate of each nation's currencies money supply. And again, the Eurozone nations are, are one. Uh, there's 19 countries there. You will see um, Canada, as you said, 204% in the last year, 62% for the Euro, 60% uh, for the uh, United, uh, for, excuse me, for the United Kingdom. 60% Turkey, United States is, is down not too much in, a, in the distant, you know, fifth to last, sixth to last at 50% trailing 12 months. That's, that's March of this year divided by March of last year. Now, obviously we caught COVID exactly during this time period. So there's big numbers uh, there, but those are, those are big numbers. Um, and obviously, again, I'm not making any comment about whether it's needed or whether uh, uh, the COVID stimulus was needed. I'm just saying these, these are the numbers, big, big numbers. And another thing I would say that the other uh, global sort of uh, tweet where you can see this is tweet 38, tweet 38. Um, there you see from basically 1970 to 2021, 2021 being the first three months of 2021 annualized. 2020 was second highest ever as far as money printing goes. It's 
compounded 35% basically annually during that year. And that that's taking all of the different, you know, all the numbers I just mentioned, right? Like US, Eurozone, UK, the pounds, all, all those things. Um, and then how do I find sort of a global average? Well, you have to weight them. So I weight them. You can absolutely do this. It's not a it's not a trick of any game. I mean, I'm, I'm taking the actual numbers, the actual inflation numbers, units on units, euros on euros, yen on yen, dollar on dollar. And then you weight those numbers each year by the value of that respective currency's monetary base in dollar terms. You have to do it in dollar terms. I mean, dollar is the world's reserve currency, as they say. It's the most quoted world reserve. It's the most quoted currency in the world. Every central bank has the dollar rate on their main page. Uh, dollars are, you know, clearly the most liquid fiat coin uh, in the world. So you take the uh, the relative weight of each currency's monetary base. Uh, you, you apply that weight to their actual trailing 12 month uh, growth per the year or the three month annualized in the case of 2021. And you'll get the chart that you get in uh, uh, tweet 38, tweet 38. And uh, yeah, 2020 was 35% annually. The only, the highest global money printing happened in 2008, the financial crisis that we talked about, 46% per annum globally. Uh, 2020 was 35% per annum globally. And 2021 is 29% globally, which on track is going to, is going to be in fifth place um, of like the modern fiat era, basically since 1970. That's what I have. So it's continuing on. Uh, I would then probably direct listeners to um, basically the end. It is tweet. Bear with me for a second. Tweet 67. There's a graph, very detailed. Uh, not sorry, not graph. It's a table of uh, all of the the top 30 floating currencies in the world. You see it's about 27.8 trillion in US dollar equivalent value, 27.8 trillion. And again, that's, I might've not even said it clearly during this pod, but that's the money supply that is most equivalent with Bitcoin. So we have Bitcoin, this famous, unbelievable new digital currency that arose, you know, 11, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, um, the ultimate supply, everyone knows it's famous, 21 million units 21 million btc what does that number compare with and so that was another reason i started this whole thing was you know you see all these various money supplies i don't want to maybe get into that too much uh here but um all these different money supplies talking about gold silver platinum palladium you know m1 m2 m3 what compares with 21 million bitcoin well it was this thing that was never published anywhere you had to actually go on to each central bank's balance sheet, find it yourself. Some, in some cases, you know, it'd be in the firewalled central bank or the Bank of China or uh, just poor, extremely poor. Like there's no APIs that work in any of these <laughs> websites. <laughs> yeah, so much of it is, is, is manual. It, some of that is, is getting better for me when, with the new website that I mentioned, but um, it's, been, it's been a slog for sure. So anyway, the, all of it is summarized there uh, as of March 31st, 2021. Uh, the trailing 12 months, which I mentioned, the actual last month annualized, which has the most noise. Uh, but at the last month annualized was about 72% uh, globally. Uh, trailing 12 months was 37%, as I mentioned. And since the begin date of each currency in the table, which which varies, there's about half of them that were going on since 1970. And for the other half that weren't there, they just weren't part of the pie. They weren't part of the balancing the weight during that period. So you can totally do it. It's not, not a problem. It's not hard to calculate. I mean, as long as you you know have the will to do it, it's not it's not difficult. You get to about twelve point nine percent compounded per annum since since the start date of basically all fiat currencies in the database, the modern fiat era. So that's a pretty hard and fixed number, twelve point nine percent. That's that's actually a big number. I mean, that's a doubling. <laughs> That's a doubling uh, a little bit uh, less than every six years. Uh, again, the price inflation that central banks tell you they're targeting generally is 2%. I don't know why it's 2%, but it is 2%. That's their magical number. And the rule of 72, uh, very briefly, you know, very uh, back of the envelope way to do it is take 72 and divide it by the uh, percent number, but take off the percent sign. So it drops the percent sign, 72 divided by two, you get 36. So a 2% inflation rate, will that will tell you the doubling time, which is a very helpful number. The doubling time of an asset or money or whatever, uh, if it increase, if it compounds, again, I'm, I'm always showing you compound growth rate, which is stronger than an annual return. It's a very important thing to keep in mind. Like 
bond yields are calculated to the compound annual growth, growth rate. Compounded, um, the fiat money supply gro grows every six years, but they tell you that prices will only double every 36 years. And uh, uh, another way to think about that is uh, if you looked at a 10% return, a lot of people think, okay, 10% growth, that must mean that my asset, <clears throat> my asset or my investment, whatever, will double every 10 years. No, actually will double faster because rule of 72 actually works perfectly at a 10% return. 72 divided by 10, keep, you know, throw off the percent sign, 72 divided by 10, a 10% return will double you every 7.2 years. So that's the power of compounding growth. You know, Thomas Jefferson said it was the eighth wonder of the world. Compounding is a very, very important thing to understand if you want to be in finance or understand anything about numbers and, and, and just growth of this stuff. So I, I knew that I needed to get a, co a, a coherent and global compound annual gr growth figure, and it is 12.9%. Uh, and I actually, we can, we can actually look at Brazil if you want, Max. I know it might be harder for the listeners. Uh, maybe you can tweet it and uh, we can, we can re refer to that. Um, well, let's just say we're referring to it now. If you want to tweet it um, at some point after the show, uh, I, I showed you Brazil, an interesting history of Brazil. Actually, two points. If you look at the, the, the global total, as I did there in tweet 67, tweet 67, Brazil's, uh, again, largest you know, country currency in Latin America. They're, since the begin date, they've gone through like six different currencies. Uh, their compound annual growth rate is 101% per year, per year. Now, I'm not saying that's what it is. That's not what it is now. That's not what it is now. Now it's trailing 12 months, 31%, 31% now. But you can score a country this way, which I want to do. And, and you can even do it with a country that's had multiple different currencies. All you, all you have to do, and the way that I did it, is you take the average monthly growth of that currency and then during the month where they reset, they got new units, right? Where they went from, uh, you know, the the cruzado to the uh, to the real or something like that. And we'll look at this uh, chart um, during that month. You just ignore that because it's gonna be like minus one hundred percent because they cut down, you know, throw off two zeros or whatever they do uh, when they feel that the confidence has run out in that currency. You just ignore that month. So you take the average of all the months in the series, you know, 50 years of data, you get one average monthly figure, you compound that, that's how you get to a compound and growth. But actually, there's another way to do it, which I didn't do it because I thought it would be maybe too complicated or confuse people. I just thought it would be easier to say average monthly growth. I do this for Bitcoin, do this for gold, silver, whatever. But I actually looked at it, if you did it, the actual proper uh, compound growth formula, which is, you know, simply... Uh, you know, we're talking about present value, future value. You know, you can find this in Excel or a, a financial calculator if you do it. Basically, it's uh, the present value divided by the, excuse me, the future value divided by the present, val present value raised to the, uh, the quantity of one divided by the number of periods that have passed minus one. That basically what that does there, it gives you, that gives you that compound annual growth that I was talking about. So again, if you calculate 10, it's not a doubling every 10 years, it's a doubling every 7.2. I know I'm getting a little bit in the weeds here. I just want to explain, I was curious because I didn't do it the actual technical financial way uh, at the very beginning when I started to do this. And I will do it actually for the, um, you know, when, when the website is upgraded. But as I just said, 101% is Brazil's monthly growth rate of their money supply over their entire period of data since 1970 raised to the 12th power is 100, 100, 101%, right? Takes the monthly raised to the 12th. Um, if you actually use the financial formula and then you waited, you waited each period by not like taking average months, but you just took the amount of days that each period's growth rate for their currency. Remember, they've gone through six, seven currencies during that time. If you wait each currency's period by the number of days, it's actually more. I wasn't sure what it would be, honestly. It'd be less, more around the same. If you do it that way, which is probably more statistically accurate, they go from 101% per annum as a scorecard to 232%, 232% per annum as a scorecard for Brazil over the last 51 years. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And this is why people call Latin American, you know, Steve Hankey, who's not a fan of Bitcoin, was on our show and he famously called and Fernando agreed with him. Uh, Latin American currencies, you know, junk currencies. And well, you know, when you're going through one, one of your currencies with a 5,600% compound annual growth rate, which happened in the nineties and in the eighties, you know, and then you take those growth rates and you have, you, you weight them based on the amount of days that have passed for each of those different periods, you get an even bigger number than what I've calculated. 
So yeah, I haven't done, incredible. yeah, I haven't done all the calculations globally for that. I will do them, but maybe that 12.9% will even go up. I'm not sure if it will. We'll have to see. It's, it's definitely, I can assure you it will be around there, but, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. So again, setters paribus, all I'm doing is showing the, you know, you, you make you dear listener make the decision of what you want to do with your money uh but i'm just showing you setters paribus the increase in the stock of money so having said all of that leading up max i don't know do you want me to describe that chart that i sent you today or yeah, yes please go a bit further into it yeah so i i titled it the modern printing history of brazil uh and i haven't i don't really send out the individual countries too much but i decided to do this because you asked about it and i was kind of curious myself because i didn't make one exactly this way so uh, you will see in the, uh, the picture there, um, I'm actually going to count them. One, you have the Cruzeiro, Cruzeiro Novo, second Cruzeiro, that's three, Cruzado four, Cruzado Novo five, third Cruzeiro six, Cruzeiro Real seven, modern Real. So it's eight. It's actually eight. <laughs> it's eight currencies in the uh, last 50 years of Brazil. Actually, this goes to 1946. Um, and you can see, so... The Brazilian Central Bank, to their credit, not all central banks do this. Turkey has not. I, I got to do some work on Turkey because, and, and you and I, Max, have talked about actually getting the monetary base of the Weimar Republic, which I would love to get. The actual, you know, not this goofy five quadrillion percent increase in the last few months of prices, you know, which anyway, you know, people are taking this stuff in wheelbarrows and whatnot that everybody likes to quote, not the price increase, but the actual increase in the money stock. I, I can't find it. Uh, I appeal to any German speaking listener if they can help me uh, find it. I know uh, you would like to see it as well, Max. It would be great to, to measure that one. In any event, uh, Brazil does it. Brazil, Brazilian Central Bank actually shows you the monetary base during these, you know, high inflationary years. It's pretty amazing. So um, I don't have them like you see in the top left. Basically, I've listed all those eight periods. Um, but you had asked me, Max, you know, where is there a point that we can see as far as like, you know, when things get out of control? And obviously my standard uh, Austrian example would be I, I, I doubt it. I think, you know, it's always going to come faster than you expect. Sometimes it might take longer than you expect, but like it, uh, when it happens, it's going to happen probably quickly. So uh, probably in my in my opinion, but I think it's going to be hard to like scientifically show that. In any event, I show, as you see there, I have the. CMU billion is, the, is the, the shaded area, the green scale. That's all eight of these increases of the money supply in CMU billion. CMU is current monetary unit. That's what these uh, central banks like to call it when they go through many, many currencies. I know there's an R dollar sign, which is the real sign for, for each one. But it's as you see these huge spikes and then drop offs and new supplies starting, that's, that's just the new currency, basically. Um, so that's on the left. And on the right, you have the trailing 12-month growth rate. So let's forget compounding for a second, but just look at, you know, compounding is an annual figure, and we can also look at the trailing 12-month annual figure for each of these uh, each of these runs, basically. And um, you will find uh, some big ones. Let's just start with the big ones, maybe. The end of the second Cruzeiro was in February 1986. At the time, they were running at a 242% uh, growth rate. The end of the Cruzado happened less than two years later. I'm sorry, a little bit more than two years later, in December 1988, they were running at a 622% rate at that time. The end of the Cruzado Novo was less than a year later. So that's, you can't even calculate trailing 12 months. So I did the monthly growth, the last one there at 62% monthly growth, monthly growth during that time. The end of the Cruzado Novo, they said, the heck with it. Let's go to the third Cruzero. That ended a couple years later in July 1993 at a 1,346% trailing 12 month growth, end of the third Cruzero. And, um, June of 1994, uh, again, less than a year. I can't give you a trailing 12 month because it even was less than a year. They reset it again. So the, that, that was, this was called the Cruzeiro Real. The Cruzeiro Real, apologies for my pronunciation, but the Cruzeiro Real, uh, June 1994, that ended at a 39% monthly growth and they reset it. And in March of 2021, they, uh, oh, sorry. That, then they reset it to the modern real. And then obviously I'm showing in March of 2021, the current trailing 12 month for the modern real is a 31% trailing 12 month. So it's usually uh, double digit, triple digit when they reset to answer your question, Max. But it's interesting. If you look at the very first one, which I skipped, the first Cruzeiro is also called the Antigo. Um, January of 1967, you see 21% trailing 12 months. You can see there was a spike there. Of over, and by the way, I chop, I, 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 I capped the percent growth as you might notice 
uh, dear listener, at 150%. Like it just, you can't see anything if you go more than, than that. So I, I capped it at 150% on the right-hand axis to show the trend 12 month growth. The January 1967, the last month of the Cruzeiro Antigo was actually only a 21% uh, trailing 12 month growth. I don't know the history of that, but it was like a year before close, you know, a year or two years, even three, four years before it was running close to hundred percent, if not over a hundred percent trailing 12 month. So I don't know the political situation in Brazil at the time in 1967. Um, but that, that, uh, was a little bit lower than you might actually expect when they reset that currency, the Antigo, their first Cruzeiro, um, a little bit lower than you might expect. And the Cruzeiro Nova, which was a couple of years later, that was also only around at about 24% trailing 12 month growth um, when they reset that one in 1969. Yeah, this, so, is, yeah. this is absolutely terrifying. I mean, <laughs> seriously, like 62% monthly growth yeah. rate. And just compared it to what I said earlier, right? Uh, just look at the very first simple concept of what's your percentage of the money supply now. Because you're not the one getting 60% new money printed uh, every month, right? So your actual savings get cut by like 33% every month. Like with, within a year, you have nothing. And this is why Brazil has had eight currencies in the last uh, 70 years, 80 years. 80 years. Yeah. And, and Brazil's <laughs> a good one, actually, because unlike, you know, we don't have Weimar yet. I don't, I, I, I want to get it. I will get it. I want to get some other ones. You know, Israel's running high one in the 80s. I don't have the original shekel. Um, Turkey is one Turkey does not, Turkey does not show you the original units <laughs> only like 15 years ago, Turkey did a major evaluation and they, uh, give they, on their central bank, they give you like a modern, uh, adjusted number. So I, I'm measuring that, but it's, I know it's not the original, so it's unfortunate, but Brazil is interesting. Brazil's huge, huge market. One of the biggest markets in the world, biggest in Latin America and, um, you know, the biggest market in Latin America and you see, you see what can happen with, uh, you know, when the, when the printing presses go wild. So I, I think it's a very, Brazil's a very interesting case. So, uh, so I, I actually, I thank you, Max, for making me do this because it's, it's interesting to put that. that you know, and it's, it's funny because Brazil is so often mentioned right together with, with, with India and, and, uh, other countries as like this up and coming nation, like that, that will provide a big, massive economy. And then you look at their monetary economics and you're like, how the fuck is anyone going to do anything productive in this shithole? <laughs> like, yeah. th this is impossible. I couldn't agree more. And, um, again, the conclusion, the conclusion that I have is very simple. You know, you look at all this stuff, the conclusion that I have is, is the same as yours. It's the same as many people that are, uh, I would say morally trying to find the, the right money and, and protect their personal savings and their family and so on and so forth. The conclusion is obviously Bitcoin. I have no problem with gold either, but uh, the modern conclusion seems to be Bitcoin. Nonetheless, nonetheless, you know, this is again where economics is like, I just, I can't do like these, you know, blustering newsletters and stuff. I mean, the um, economics is so full of hubris. Like people, people just, they, they it's, it's, it's like you can, you can show them just mountains and mountains of data that, sh that shows that we're probably correct with our assumptions about what inflation does with prices, you know, how supply is, you know, probably in excess of the demand. <laughs> and, uh, it's, you know, you're going to have probably, yeah, you're going to have some, uh, increase in, in prices. Um, but the, the, the powers that be the mainstream media, whatever the mouthpieces are, the flavor of the day, whatever they want to talk about, it's just, it's never front news. They're never going to talk about it. And, um, you know, so, so I, I, I hasten to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying Bitcoin's going to go to a billion dollars tomorrow and dollar equivalent exchange rate. Right. I'm not saying that. Um, what I am saying is that this is, you know, before you even think about interest rates or, uh, unemployment or just all these other goofy, like headlines, you know, jobs, numbers or whatever. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that like, so, so brazenly, I mean, I, I feel for the people that are suffering, uh, uh specifically because of COVID and, and, and many other tragedies in the world. But, um, that before you can even, again, go through the door of that arena, as I said, like the main stage is not, it's not those things. It's, it's, it's the money supply. It should always be the money supply. And, uh, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And w one of the things that I find curious, because I mean, we see with Brazil here, even after current currency reset, 
right? Day one, they create money like crazy, right? So they, they don't learn anything about uh, like any, any lessons from that. And then looking on your main tweet thread for Q1, uh, year number thir uh, tweet number 38, which shows the fiat production rate um, in, in percentage per annual compounded growth rate. And, you know, uh, it, usually it tends between seven to maybe 15 uh, percentage points per year. Um, but, and there are, of course, the, the extremes like 2008, where we're up to 46% or now 2020 with 35%. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, substantial, uh, like half of your wealth is all of a sudden with someone else. So, you know, that's something to consider, yep. but there are a couple of years, uh, worth noting where the increase is very low. Uh, specifically, I want to point out 2018 with 2% uh, inflation and 2019 with 1% inflation. Uh, and that seems to be quite cute, uh, as it seems that the, that the fiat banksters tried to restrain their thieving for just two years. <laughs> well, we, we see how it turned out in the long term, but uh, joking aside, like what's, what's the reason here? Why are those two years such a low inflation? Yeah, yeah. So the U.S. primarily was the uh, the front runner in that, as I mentioned. Um, the U.S. was really trying to what they called normalize its balance sheet, which you know, again, when economists, you know, again, who, who, you know, they have no skin in the game, whatever. But when they do these prognostications and these reports and these research things, whatever, there was always this idea that this stuff would be temporary, as it always is, right? You know, tax increase is temporary. This regulation is temporary. This tariff is temporary. But it never is at the, at the end of the day. So it was from 2008 on always the idea that this was like a temporary measure to restore the economy and why the economy is so bad. No one answers that question, but it was always supposed to be a temporary measure to fix the problems that happened before 2008. Yet, yet, as we all know, it doesn't really work that way. And even though they tried to get apparently back to this normalized trend that would have occurred anyway, had we stayed normal, right, from 2008 to 2019, they never got there. They definitely didn't get there. They were decreasing the money supply during uh, those couple of years, 2014 to 2019, but still not uh, not enough to, to say normalize it if you regressed to where it would be if you were still on the rates of growth from 28, 2008 and before. And, uh, and then, you know, COVID hit and we had to just explode the money supply again. But as we all know, those that were sort of paying attention, there were plenty of warning signs, um, plenty of uh, hiccups and tantrums that would happen were happening in the treasury markets and in these uh, money supply, money markets, uh, you know, in September of 2019, there was a big one. Uh, interest rates spiked like up to 10% for the overnight rate very quickly because basically uh, everyone was holding their reserves and some people needed reserves to not meet their reserve ratio and they were not available. So the interest rate spiked and, you know, they tried to act like this wasn't like quantitative easing when they pumped some money in the market at that point, but it was, and, um, you know, do what they do, what they do, know what they say. That's for sure. Uh, or watch what they do, know what they say, I guess. That's for sure. What you need to take from, I think from this lesson is, uh, it doesn't matter if they say 2% growth per year, you should at least consider, again, I'm not saying that prices increase 12.9% on balance of the last 50 years. I'm not saying that. I am saying setters paribus, uh, prices will rise if the money supply rises, setters paribus, it means nothing else changes. I am saying that, and then I am saying that the money supply, money supply has risen on balance, weighted for each country's monetary base, it has risen 12.9, almost 13%, you know, just call it mid 12 to 13% on balance compounded every year since 1970s. That's a lot higher to me than any central bank ever tells me, any economist, whatever. And yeah, it probably right there explains why, um, it explains why they were, you know, really trying to normalize this in 2018, 2019, and they just figured out that they couldn't do it. And, and uh, I should hasten to say, yeah, that there were problems even before COVID, but once COVID hit, then it was just insane. And Canada is a prime example. Cam Canada wasn't even the top 10. And for the actions that they've taken in COVID, uh, the expansion of their monetary base. It's, it's truly incredible. It's, it's just as incredible as what happened to the United States in 2008. I mean, Canada was not in the top 10 and they didn't actually lose relatively speaking that much of their currency purchasing power, their exchange rate relative to the dollar. I mean, they moved into the top 10 after never being in the top 10. Uh, so that's an interesting one. Um, you know, Switzerland as well is one that's a big one. 
Uh, yeah, never, fun. never let a good crisis go to waste as an excuse for money printing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, just I, I, it's, it's. I'm not telling people to take it with a grain of salt or like anything. I mean, this is. I stand behind these numbers. They're all sourced and cited. Um, it's absolutely what they are. Uh, there's, it's absolutely what what they are. There's, these are the facts. These are the numbers. And so I just say, look, you know, juxtapose that with what you hear if you pay attention to the financial news, if you pay attention to, um, you know, economists and what. You know, apparently central bankers were surprised that interest rate was running hot last quarter at four uh, <laughs> percent. You know, per annum. I mean, it's just. Um, it's just interesting. It's just interesting to uh, to see the the double speak and the uh, just ignoring of the facts so often. Um, and I'm not I'm not even interested in that stuff anyway. This is what interests me. I like sort of digging into the numbers and find you know presenting it in a way that's hopefully understandable to uh, to the average to the average uh, average listener, I guess, average, average reader. So yeah. One of the charts that I find super fascinating and that you sneakily put at the very end of this amazing tweet thread at number 70 uh, is a chart that shows the total money supply of each uh, monetary asset mm -hmm. um, in uh, denominated in US dollars. Uh, and we see here that B uh, Bitcoin is already number uh, six. Uh, so it is a larger currency than the Swiss franc. And just a bit smaller uh, than the uh, United Kingdom pound. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is Bitcoin is already a, a beast uh, and much larger than most uh, fiat currencies. Yeah, and you also show the price at which Bitcoin overtakes uh, the U.S. dollar price at which Bitcoin will overtake the other currencies. Now, notice, of course, this is at today's uh, purchasing power for the U.S. dollar and at the today's uh, money supply for each of these uh, fiat shitcoins. Uh, but we see that the British pound is overtaken at 65,000 Bitcoin uh, or U.S. dollar per one Bitcoin. Uh, the Chinese one at 266,000. Uh, the United States dollars at 312,000. Yeah, uh, the Japan uh, yen, I think, at 311. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the euro at 352,000 US dollar for one Bitcoin. Um, so I, I think that's quite interesting because for me, like 350,000 Bitcoin, that kind of just seems like two weeks around in the next bull cycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I love it. I love it, Max. Yeah. I mean, Whew. Yeah, I, I think Michael Saylor is doing a great justice uh, to mainstream uh, journalists, economists, and people that he's debating on this because uh, he's right. He's really putting his money where his mouth is, and um, you could miss it. I mean, you, you could miss it. That's the extraordinary thing with this sort of – even the way that money works, really. It, it really is a Pareto distribution. Um, it, it really is uh, pretty much winner take all. It's hard to know – how this would look in the absence of a central bank per country, but even in the presence of central bank per country, as you can see that the four largest markets have just dominated, um, you know, the, the Eurozone nations, of, you know, so 19 countries, not the entire Eurozone, but Eurozone nations that use the Euro, uh, the yen, the dollar, and the yuan, uh, that is, uh, you know, 90, almost 90% 90 of, uh, of the total right there. It's like 85%. And then you got the formerly Great British Pound there, which is basically the last of the mid majors. It's the last one that Bitcoin needs to take down. And Bitcoin actually, as we know, is you know uh, down a little bit from when this chart was posted. Um, it's close around to the Swiss franc value, but um, that that will be another thing that's going to be dynamic in the new website, so people can look forward to that. But it'll be better tracked from that from that perspective. But uh, uh, I I think it's extremely interesting that Bitcoin is on the cusp of fast of passing the uh largest historical currency fiat currency in the world which is the british pound i mean it was basically before the dollar was the pound worldwide so I never set on the british empire and um that was the one and and that's really it's only about 60 you're, you're looking at a roughly sixty five thousand per coin it was very close to passing that about three weeks ago about, about a month ago i didn't put out a report because it wasn't enough of a cushion i'm glad i didn't at the time like an update an alert if you will that will be an interesting one. I imagine when it passes, it'll blow right by it. But that's that's a very interesting one. And keep in mind, that's a, that's an opaque central bank, in my opinion. I mean, the, about the only thing you can see on the liability side, which is the monetary base side, is the notes and coins of of uh, of 
the entire United Kingdom. But other than that, they don't show any other sort of uh, liabilities. Literally, the last of the big majors is the um, la the last. Basically, what I was saying was the last of the uh, mid majors is interestingly the uh, formerly Great British Pound. You know, the oldest fiat currency in the world, and uh, you know, not necessarily a, a transparent balance sheet either. But uh, the two things that they do show United Kingdom wide are sterling notes and coins in circulation and uh, reserve balances with the Bank of England. So that's about all you're going to get from the Bank of England's balance sheet that way. Uh, balance sheets are going to be published as well as part of uh, the new website and the new uh, service that I plan to launch uh, hopefully this year. Hopefully this year, fingers crossed. But um, uh, it's very interesting to me that it's that it's on the cusp of passing the, the British pound. And, and I, I think we had an audio show just before. I just want to remind uh, or say again what I said before, but you know, I was I was very I was very uh, close to publishing an alert about a month ago when Bitcoin did come very close to passing the British pound in valuation, uh, you know, U.S. dollar equivalent. But I did not uh, because I just didn't think it was enough of a buffer, and and I'm glad I didn't because it went back down. But I suspect that when it does, it's just going to blow right by it. And um, you know, the it, this this is the number. This you know, if you want to know what these uh, 18 point Seven million Bitcoin count for right now, uh, and where the twenty-one million is going in the future, it's it's the monetary base. It's it's the money supply. There is a money supply uh, that that equates to uh, to Bitcoin, and this is it. Yes, and you know, as you say, I think it will swoop past or it will fly past the the pound very quickly, and then the same if it gets into the top four or even top three currencies. Like there is not a large difference between the U.S. dollar and the euro, so nations yeah. like three hundred twelve thousand U.S. dollars versus three hundred fifty-two. Yep. I, 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 again, like that—that that seems like a good twenty-four hour green camel. <laughs> 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 you know? Yep, yep. It's pretty insane. It is pretty insane. You know, before he uh, went all on, you know, all out on olive oil. Like uh, I liked a lot of the celebisms, and uh, you know, skin in the game is important. Um, you don't have to even, uh, you don't have to have the same conclusion that I have, and, and clearly you have, Max, to this research. You don't have to share the same conclusion. But what you should know is that we have uh, certainly a moral and I think even an intellectual, uh, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for here? We're morally and intellectually vested, let's say, uh, and not just financially vested in this asset. And so we do have skin in the game. and. Um, for people that just sort of brush this off or people that say you don't need to look at the money supply or it's better, it's more important to look at interest rates. You know, I, I'm just, I'm sort of baffled by that. It's not how classical economics was done. In, in, in the, the basic, the basic catalactic stuff, you know, prices, supply, demand. I mean, you're talking about a major side of the equation there. <laughs> One half of the economic equation, right? The supply side. Uh, I think you got to look at it. Demand is actually very hard to interpret. Demand can be very hard to interpret unless you're a business and no one's coming in your stores, then it's very easy to interpret. But, uh, you know, catalactically, like a, from a calculation perspective, demand can be difficult and economists come up with these crazy models to do so. But supply is very easy. Supply is very easy. It's very concrete. It's there. We don't know how transparent they are on all of the numbers. I will agree with that. I certainly will say that. And that's why another reason what the, the bright, beautiful light that Bitcoin shines on the financial and monetary system. But... Uh, you know, the best we have is, is, is what we call here the monetary base. The supply exists. And uh, I do encourage people to, to track it more and follow it more. Yeah. And what I'm also interested in is a bit of a, of a future outlook. Uh, and again, on the supply side, because as you say, demand is crazy. Uh, so let's focus on the supply side. Like as, I mean, inevitably the, the fiat system is, is built to pump forever and to print money forever. Right. Yeah. So th they will not stop. So meaning the, the money stock for, for all fiat shit coins will, will continue to increase. And it's a territory sparbus again, that, that means that the purchasing power of each of these units of, of shit coins will decrease. What do you think, like, how will this chart of the Bitcoin dominance index, uh, how will that look in the near future where fiat shit coins continue to, to print and increase their money stock? Uh, I think it will go up. I think number go up is a real thing. I think um, the uh, the dynamics of Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin energy, uh, Bitcoin uh, efficiency, 
uh, all of those things uh, continue to prove themselves uh, day in and day out, no matter what you know one Elon Musk or one uh, you know news reporter might say or whatever. Um, these things are are real, and uh, the chart which you didn't mention, which I like to call the real Bitcoin dominance index. It's the the last slide. It's tweet seventy. Uh, it's a penultimate slide, actually, from what we just saw. It's, it's tweet 69, actually. Um, the real Bitcoin dominance index. Bitcoin is past silver as of, uh, as of uh, this year in around February. It's past the Swiss franc. It's now 16% roughly of the United States dollar's monetary base at 50,000. Let's just keep using that number. Uh, 10% of, uh, of gold taking out um, taking out uh, industrial gold, and you get to about nine trillion. Some people quote over ten trillion for gold. I, I get to about nine trillion. This, there, there's no one knows this answer, of course, but about nine percent of uh, of uh, nine to ten percent of of gold um, that's not in industry, and three point three percent of the global money supply. I mean, you know, in the first bubble, in uh, you know, from zero to thirty dollars in the first. Uh, was a slash dot article in 2011 that was uh, zero, you know went from 0.000% to 0.001% of the monetary base globally, and then 2014, uh, it, 2013 December it peaked at 0.1% of global monetary base, 1.1% in December of 2017. Now it's 3.3%. You know, I don't know where it's going to go in the next month, or the next three months, or the next six months, but I know that the uh, the uh, competitive forces that make Bitcoin so intriguing and why you know young people like it and old people can't stand it um <laughs> i know that they exist and they're there and they're real so i do think those things are going to um continue how that plays out over the really long long run um regarding fiat i think will be interesting uh the risk that central banks will take if they try to do this cbdc thing and by the way brazil has done really the first proto CBDC. It's not even a. It's not a blockchain-based CBDC. But they they got again the one of the more major countries in the world. Uh, from October of last year, they they started this thing called the Pix account, which is part of the monetary base. I actually, thank one of our listeners for pointing this out. Fernando and I talked about it as well uh, after. But I, it's not really readily readily available on the Bank of Brazil's website. But it's called the Pix account. It's an app on the phone. You know, centrally managed and planned. Uh, that it's it's going to be a central central digital balance of currency. So it it, it is it's, you know it's it's proto digital currency that's going to come. You know China's going to do it. The U.S. wants to do it. Bank of England wants to do it. Everyone wants to do it. Right? European Union wants to do it. I do think that the risk that these banks are taking, with not being a technologist myself, is just a major hack for their system. I mean, it's not a closed loop. You know, I mean, there's enough problems with you know third party vendors getting hacked and having problems in the banking system as it is. But when you have like a major portion of your monetary base now circulating under this, whether I don't know, you call it a publicly, publicly controlled blockchain or this CBDC or whatever you want to call it, I do think hacking is still a big risk for them if they try to go into the CBD space. So Bitcoin still remains uh, pristine in that case. But even if they don't, uh, even if they can make their CBDCs work, um, they're going to have to start reserving Bitcoin at some point. And this is another thing that I'm tracking, right? And another thing that will be posted with the new website as well is let's, let's dig deeper in the central bank balance sheets a little bit. Remember, these are the largest players in the economy uh, besides the treasuries and the governments themselves, right? The tax and spend. These are the largest players in the economy. Um, central banks have not, at least publicly, reserved Bitcoin. You know, you have stuff like Belarus, North Korea, uh, Kenya, Kenya, I don't even mean to put Ken Kenya is probably better run than the other two that I mentioned first, but um, Kenya will, at some, I, I, as far as I can, I have not seen Bitcoin yet on Kenya's balance sheet, but they have mentioned that they're going to do it. It will be very interesting, and I'm ready for it, by the way. I'm ready to start tracking CBDCs. I'm ready to start tracking Bitcoin on central bank's balance sheets, because once they take Bitcoin onto their balance sheet, uh, the market is going to respond to that. And I'm not you know, I don't mean to sound like, oh, this is like another great bullish thing for Bitcoin. Yeah, I think it will be, but it's also an undeniable, it's just an undeniable fact of Bitcoin's acceptance if you have the major monopolistic providers of money reserving their monetary base with something that's not called this government bond, right? The, not the national debt, not the full faith and credit of their respective government, 
but you have, you know, you're going to have to start to have Facebook stock, uh, Apple stock, corporate debt, which is happening already. And then you're going to have Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to another uh, international reserve. It's part of that Forex reserve basis, basically. That's going to be interesting to see. And I do think that's probably going to happen along with CBDCs before, before anything else. Uh, it's just, that's, that's the next logical step and, and I'll be, I'll be ready for it. Yeah, right. And one of the highlights here is that, again, these uh, central bank digital currencies are base money, right? And, and they are then part of our analysis here. Uh, so this is a very important new uh, thing to look out for. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, one of the other things I'm curious about, uh, because right now uh, you're basically a, a shitcoin researcher denominating your research in US dollars, right? uh, when the switch to Bitcoin, because I think a monetary base analysis denominated in Bitcoin would be extremely interesting as well. Well, it's going to be denominated in Bitcoin when it's uh, under one, uh, the ratio, because um, right now the ratio is, uh, let me find it for you. Uh, I should be able to just do it on my head, but I, I can't, but it's uh, too many numbers in my head right now. The ratio right now is 29. Yeah, it's about 30. It's about 30. Right. So, I mean, you're roughly, uh, let, let's say Bitcoin's at a trillion. Let's say fiat monetary base is at 30 trillion, roughly dollar equivalent. Then you're at a 30x ratio. When that ratio goes to one and under one, which I actually did write on the paper as well in the, in the, in the report there. I mean, th then that, that, only, that only signifies, that's a signal to the market that we are now in a you know, Bitcoin standard. Things will be dominating Bitcoin. But the other reason, which is uh, more important, is anything over 21 million Bitcoin doesn't really make sense. So with dollars, we know that there's no limit, right? To how much they can print. And yeah, only even though the monetary base of the U.S. dollar is only, uh, you know, five, six, seven trillion at any given day, um, the amount of dollar denominated assets is in the, you know, hundreds of trillions. You know, maybe with derivatives, we're in the quadrillions of dollars, right? Even though none of that will ever be able to be redeemed for base money if there ever was like a true run on the banks you know it'd be impossible like you just shut down you know move to bitcoin the next day if people actually like ran on the banks today which they won't because of you know uh, legal tender laws and fda uh, fdic insurance and so on and so forth it makes sense to do this in dollars uh now because that you know it, that's the that's the current monetary unit of the day but i will i will for interest show in the in the in the website that's coming up i'm going to show some other interesting denominations and Bitcoin will be one of them, of course, but I don't necessarily like it when you have something that just shows know, like 300 million Bitcoin or something is, uh, as the, is the ratio of, of what that, you know, what that money supply is worth. And, uh, as much as I have no problem with those guys, the, the, the guys that do the, I don't know them, whatever, but they do the, uh, fiat, fiat cap or fiat market cap, um, which is quoted sometimes, you know, that that's using M2, which again is that's. You're talking about claims now. You're in the world of bankers' credit and and credit and and debt and and loans and, and and investments. That's not the money. That's not the basic money. That's not why you can compare that to 21 million Bitcoin. But anyway, they do do that, and then they do those calculations where they say, you know, I don't know, Japan's monetary, Japan's M2 is 30 million, 30, 300 million Bitcoin. I'm just making up numbers. I don't know the actual number, but that doesn't seem to me to be very intuitive, right? Because Bitcoin is extremely intuitive, and in that we know that there can never be more than 21 million units. Uh, it's a very unique money supply. So probably I will never, probably, I'm not saying for sure, uh, but probably I won't show money supplies. If you were to make that quick conversion and just, even if you were just looking at say Bitcoin versus the dollar, right? You would get a number priced in Bitcoin that's more than 21 million Bitcoin. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, do it. You can either do it in percent as I've done there, real Bitcoin dominance index, about 16% of the dollar or in dollar terms. Uh, but once it gets to one, once it gets to one, uh, definitely we are on our way to a Bitcoin standard. And that's when I think uh, most people anyway, probably long before Max, long before people are going to be quoting things in Bitcoin anyway. So um, it'll be quite clear, I imagine, to the market at that point. Well, but don't underestimate Bitcoin. It might very well be that Bitcoin pumps so quickly that we reach these numbers before you get to release the website. <laughs> right, so uh, hurry up. <laughs> a true point. True point, my friend. Uh, I, a point taken and I need, I need to get, you know, get it out, but it's just, it's, the more you dig into numbers, the more you want to do more and it's, it's hard to. It's hard to draw a line in the sand, let's say. But uh... Uh, one, th uh, one quick highlighting finish that I would like to bring up with as, as one final rant is that 
I'm I'm baffled that the claims on the fiat based money are traded at par with the base money. Like that really baffles me that yeah. like cash is has the same perceived value as a uh, uh, like a credit card payment has. Yeah. Uh yeah. because it's just su it's such a very 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 different thing that that you give and that you receive. So and so it seems that there's some weird misalignment of valuations in the fiat money market itself like so th th therefore does it then not make sense to actually include uh, those claims on money into the comparison as well yeah good point um i i don't you know i don't know the answer to that um i i think this does tend to uh this does tend to shed a light, though, a little bit on what Friedrich Hayek says, you know, when we talk about money is it's not necessarily the word money that we should focus on. It might be this sort of moneyness or focusing on the asset that's most saleable. And then the next one and the next one, um, you know, as Menger was talking about as well, um, we can derive and, and determine, which is very easily and, you know, easily done with certain commodities. And obviously we know Mises and Rothbard in particular had a very soft spot for gold. Uh, we can we can certainly arrive at certain commodities that have uh, been most closely associated with money throughout the the millennia. Gold, silver, uh, copper was one as well. Bronze uh, alloys of copper and and other base metals happened even during the industrial revolution in Britain. Britain was actually under a tri metal standard: gold, silver, and 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 copper. Basically, it's bronze alloys of copper. Um, so y you don't ever know. Uh, completely what might rule the day as money. Obviously, we have our uh, ducks in a row on, on Bitcoin, and we're pretty clear on Bitcoin. Uh, th that's the conclusion that makes sense for us. Um, but in the absence of a Bitcoin world, yeah, why is it that, uh, you know, claims like credit card payments or your, when you see dollars just sitting in your bank account, why does that trade and you can make a Venmo payment or a SEPA payment if you're in Europe, it's goodwill European payment system. Why can you just trade at par with the actual note itself. And I think the reason might be, and this might surprise some hard money people as well, is that um, that's just what the market is accepting. I'm not saying that's the only reason. There definitely are manipulations that occur with these banks who also have licenses, charters granted by the state. Um, you just can't compete in some ways uh, outside of these systems, at least prior to Bitcoin. Uh, so they're probably look towards the monopoly look towards the uh the uh you know the the, the special privilege is granted to the state to determine the value of that money and to say what needs to be accepted and what doesn't you know legal tender laws is another way to put that legal tender laws extremely important look to fdic insurance which is you know this backup which in the united states case i'm quoting but of course this happened worldwide in most countries um in the 20th century is it's another backstop that is literally there's nothing there there's no there's no money there it's not sitting in a vault backing up as, as an insurance sort of plan. It's just a state, it's a made up state state uh, insurance plan to back your money, you know, X hundred thousand dollars or euros that you have in the bank. So those things prop up the value of the claims, but then there might probably be some regular free market stuff as well that, you know, people prefer a little bit more uh, digital or checking bankers claim type of media, it's called fiduciary media over the base money media. It's probably some of that as well. So it's a it's a mixture of all of those things. Um, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is Bitcoin doesn't care. You can hold it. You don't have to. The protocol is going to keep going. It can't be influenced from outsiders as we've seen. So it's a beautiful it's a beautiful solution to these uh, problems. And I think one thing we probably can talk about next time, Max, is is exploring more of this uh, role of fiduciary media in Bitcoin. You know, if we go into like. Uh, money warehouses or if we go into uh regular bitcoin banks which are exchanges if we go into things like lightning and liquid these sort of level uh 1.5 level two uh layered systems of bitcoin uh will certainly be fascinating in the future and to see how those will compete with not only fiat media but also with base money on chain bitcoin media and you know will we see any major disruptions in the bitcoin market there based on uh premiums or discounts uh, over uh over or under par. Does that make sense? 
Oh, absolutely. And uh, I would love to join you at the Crypto Voices podcast uh, <laughs> uh, to have that conversation about fiduciary media in a Bitcoin context. Uh, because I think especially, I mean, of course, we see that with custodial uh, Bitcoin wallets, money warehouses, uh, yeah. but then we also see it with side chains and Lightning Network might play an interesting role in that. Yeah. Um, uh, like it's it's a very interesting analysis to think those Austrian praxeological thoughts in this new 21st Bitcoin century. Uh, uh, so I think it's a, a, yeah, that would be a great conversation. Let's have it. Let's do it for sure, Max, for sure. But I enjoyed awesome. this one. I enjoyed this one. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy the present. Uh, we can't be completely uh, low time preference in everything we do. Enjoy the day. I, I enjoyed it very much. Definitely look forward to speaking again soon. But I'm enjoying this day as well. <laughs> as as a strange of an economic ending that was, I tried to I tried to bring it up for you. <laughs> yes, the, the ever conundrums of uh, how much you can lower your time preference. Yeah. Uh, but well, why not both? Let's talk today and tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to me, man. <laughs> awesome. Matthew, thank you very so much for joining. Uh, that was an awesome conversation, a great deep dive uh, into all of these things of, of praxeology and, and ethics and then ultimately money supply. Uh, and that's such an important topic to understand. And hopefully we shed a light of the urgency uh, that is currently at hand uh, because it is quite crazy times in the fiat world. Well, thankfully, we do have Bitcoin. Uh, and yeah. that was, of course, our monumental conclusion of this uh, 15 block conversation. <laughs> but in any case, Matthew, <laughs> thanks a bunch for coming on and talk to you later. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Max, for all you do. And uh, always a pleasure. Yeah.